Hello and welcome to weekend two of the Zwift Games. I'm Jess Cox. And I'm Danny Rowe. And for the next two and a half hours, we'll be bringing you all the action from this evening's event. It's going to be, for want of a better word, epic. Now, for those not in the know, the Zwift Games are comprised of a series of community events that are going to be running throughout the month that absolutely anyone can take part in. And then, at the weekends, it's time for the Elite Championships, as our top Zwifters take on the same courses as the community. And you also get to join us in the studio and watch all the fun. And for the first time ever in a Championships, we've had a totally open entry process and any top level Zwifter could enter, which makes this the widest and the most stacked elite field that we have ever seen. So across the men's and women's races, over, the, over 300 athletes from 33 nations will be saddling up for the next two weeks to truly determine who is the best Zwifter in the world. Last weekend, we had the men's and women's sprint, and now we're going to give you a quick recap of what happened there, how things are set up in the overall and what we've still got to look forward to over the next weekends of racing. Oh, it's gonna be exciting, I can't wait. It's gonna be a brilliant evening, particularly tonight. Let's start with a quick recap, though, of last weekend. It was three back-to-back -back races, the first race on the loop-de-loop -loop course, but only 30 riders would go through to race two. Vidar Mail taking out that one ahead of Brian Duffy Jr and Freddie Ovette in third. Race two on the new Jurassic Coast route was a tactical masterclass with only the top 10 going through, with Hovard Yelnes timing his sprint perfectly for the win. The final race was on the Glasgow Crit Circuit and it all came down to one extraordinary piece of Zwift craft from Michael Kaminsky to take the win and that first gold Tron bike of these Zwift games. So this is how they stacked up in the top 10 and the Wahoo overall at the end of week one. If you haven't, do go back and watch the sprint races. They are absolutely insane. They were amazing. Well, that sets us up really nicely for today and the epic championship. Just look at that course. It's an absolute beast. We're going to be diving into this in detail much more closely in just a second. Oh, do make sure you also tune in for the women's race tomorrow, don't forget. Absolutely. The last weekend of the Zwift Games is a mountaintop showdown on the mythical Alpe Zwift to crown the ultimate climber. And the points collected in this race will also determine the winner of the Wahoo overall. That's going to be exciting. Now, just a very important reminder on those prizes then. The winners of each individual championship get a gold concept Z1 bike in game. And then there's some great prize money on offer for the podium. $7,000 for the winners, $5,000 for second place and $3,000 for third, Danny. Amazing, isn't it? And then the big one the Wahoo Overall Championship. $10,000 to whoever grasps their way to the win. I wouldn't complain if I found that down the back of the sofa. Absolutely not. Right, the other thing to remember as well is they're gonna be winning a Wahoo Kicker bike. And uh, as we all know, it's the most stable platform to be doing is lifting racing on anyway. But as we have a quick look at it now, Look at those colours, look at the glistening gold uh, decals because this is an utterly unique machine. If you see someone Zwifting on this, social media or in IRL, you know why they've got it. They are a Zwift Games winner. It's beautiful, isn't it? And that will surely give you a few extra watts as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Well, here he is then, our overall leader, Mikhail Kaminsky. You'll be able to spot him on the road today as he'll be wearing the gold leader's jersey, riding on his gold concept Z1 bike. It is beautiful and he is going to be very hard to miss. So we've seen what the overall championship's about. Now, should we take a look into the epic championships in a bit more detail? Because the course is worthy of a dive in. If you were watching last week's Jurassic Coast route, you'll recognize quite a lot of the early part because we ride out in the direction, going southward towards Titan's Grove. At Titan's Grove, of course, there's a thousand dollar sprint preem as well, and they pick up a draft power up as well before heading south, back through the finish there at Squash Cotch Sprints where we had the finish last week. Then up that big climb of the jungle where it is right now on our map. The jungle climb is going to be a crucial midsection before going back over Titans Grove, picking up another thousand pound preem there and crucially, Danny, then that draft power up. Yeah, it's going to be absolutely savage. 81 and a half kilometers. It's a long one with two ascents up Titans Grove as well. And of course the finishing climb too. So the riders are going to have to be really smart out there tonight. Yeah, they have an uphill finish as well, let's not forget. So that is going to be a, a, a brilliant end point to what you, as you say, is a very, very long race for Swift. 
Well, that's our course. Now, our start list is very definitely a who's who of Zwift cycling talent because we've got Zwift Grand Prix winners, national champions, top 10 finishers at world championships, Olympic esports winners, IRL pros, and the current world champion. We have indeed. It was hard narrowing it down to just five, but let's have a look at the riders to watch for this race. So we're going to start with a, a very obvious pick, Michal Kaminski, our winner from the streets of Glasgow in last week's final sprint race. He, who we know is wearing that gold jersey and we don't even need to look at his stats to know how good he is because those of you who watched last week will also know he is a brilliant tactician. He was great, wasn't he? We also have James Barnes. He finished fourth in last year's sprint. His longer watts per kilo, that 20 minute watts per kilo, are the lowest of these riders we've picked out. So potentially might struggle there, but look, he's sneaky. So I think that will hold him in good stead tonight. Should do, shouldn't it? Next up, uh, the Australian Josh Harris. So I can give you a teaser here. Now we've actually caught a little bit of a word with her, which we'll, him, which we'll come on to in a moment in an interview. Um, Josh, describes himself as a tactical, attentive all-rounder. So if that's true, it will serve him very well. He sits middle at the moment of our best favourites here in the standings. He does indeed. Our world champion, Bjorn Andresen, he was 23rd in the sprint last week. So he obviously didn't then make it into that next race. He's in the stripe, so that will give him a lot of extra power here. And he's aggressive, which I'm slightly worried about on tonight's course. Being 81.5 kilometres, of course, I think you are going to need to be very savvy in the way that you ride. I hate to say it as well, he is so easy to spot in that jersey as well. What a what a target he always is as well. He describes his best, his favourite Zwift race as the Zwift UCI Worlds in 2023, of which of course <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, last up, the Belgian rider Lennart Tugels. He is one of those riders, of which there are many in this field, who are also in real life pros on the road. Um, we've got some pro mountain bikers in here as well, of course, not just road riders, but he is one of them who, who blends the two brilliantly and he should be a really good rider to watch in this longer distance race specifically. And look at his favourite Zwift race, uphill finishes, and that is what we've got tonight. So I think he's going to be fresh and ready for tonight. Mm. Who would play you in a movie? Arnold Schwarzenegger, he says. As I think I mentioned last week, absolutely none of those guys are even anywhere near big enough to be uh, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, but there we go. Anyway. <laughs> yes. You'll also see the full rider start list at the bottom of the screen at the start of each race. So, we've seen the route, we've seen the riders from our humble perspective, but let's hear from Josh Harris himself, shall we? I teased it just now. He had a chat with Dave Towell about his thoughts on the upcoming epic race today. I am really excited to be heading down to Tasmania to check in with our man, Josh Harris. Josh, how are you doing? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me, Dave. Is this the most exciting time for esports that you've witnessed coming into this Swift Games? I'm feeling an energy I've never felt before. Yeah, I'm the same. As soon as the Swift Games was announced, I was, I was super excited. The fact that we get to do three to five different races, it's a great opportunity to do that over a series of a few weeks. Uh, it's you know, it's not like the previous World Champs format where, you know, you, you race 17 minutes and if you're not the best sprinter in, in the world, then then you're done. So really looking forward to having, having an opportunity, especially as someone who's probably a bit of an all-rounder, to be able to do the epic, to do the climb and to do the, the sprint race. It's, yeah, it's going to be good. Heading into the epic championship, I don't know how closely you've looked at the route, but if you have, can Very. you tell me maybe some some very yeah good can we talk about that then uh, break down maybe where you think your strong points might be i really pride myself on the tactical side of swift so all of those little things i'm usually pretty on top of and i've studied the, the route fairly well it's quite a punchy course i do like it overall in terms of how it's going to play out that you really don't know and the fields are so big and strong that that it, it could go many ways like you're going to have to just follow so many different riders and the, the final on the helicom though i think that's um most likely what it's going to come down to you're not going to be able to sneak away at the start of helicom everyone's going to be all in for that final 90 seconds um unless a breakaway is already up the road how much of this getting on top of the podium is going to come down to ability how much is dna and how much of it is luck I think the way that this course finishes, it's it's going to be down to probably power most. 
you know, you're going to have to make your move at the at the correct time. But it's it's not a course where you can have that bit of bit of luck at the end and, and sneak away like I did in the Epic. It's going to come down to who's got the best power over the last minute of, of the race if there is that group of 15 riders together, I think. With no further ado, let's get right into the quick fire section. Favorite Tron bike lighting color? Oh, it has to be the gold Tron to win the Zwift Games. Favorite Zwift racing world? Scotland. Breakaway or bunch sprint? Sprint from the breakaway. Have you seen the Yeti? I've seen videos of the Yeti. Uh, maybe, maybe in the climb race we'll uh, we'll see him, and he, he might give me a, a bit of a spur on. But uh, I, I don't recall seeing him on the Alp. Josh, it has been really wonderful getting to know you. I'm a big fan. Good luck in the Zwift Games. Thanks, Dave. Dave, appreciate it. Oh, he hasn't seen it yet. Tea. <laughs> well, I'm good. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet either. Um, oh, interesting to grab his thoughts about things. He sounds confident and maybe, I don't think Dave was that surprised there to hear how well prepared he is and his knowledge of the Zwifting world and Watopia itself is obviously key to him. Yeah, I think you have to be. You know, he said there that he prides himself on the technicalities of knowing what to do in the race and how important that is. So I think he'll know exactly where he's going to use his power-ups even before the race today. I think that will be really key. He also mentioned the importance of that final KOM, didn't he? So. I'm sure all the riders will be ready for it. Crucially, as he said, he thinks this might not come down to it just being a pure sprint fest at the very end of it. So I don't think it will. If we look at the course and how savage that is, I think we're going to see a small group coming into that final hill to the finish. Mm. Now, throughout these Zwift games, we're going to be having some very special guests. It won't just be us. Uh, <laughs> <It> won't. Thankfully. <laughs> and they're going to be helping us dissect all the action as well. Nathan Guerra and Matt Stevens will be our commentary team during the races this weekend. And joining them to offer her expert analysis today, we've got Elise Gallegos all the way from Huntsville, Alabama. Elise is one of our top female riders and will be popping in throughout the race to provide her unique insights during the action. Well, there can be no better combo to give us the lowdown on today's race. So over to you guys. Thanks a lot, Jez and Danny. Super excited for this epic race. It's awesome to have Elise Gallegos from the Wahoo Lacole team with us here to be checking this out. Elise, this course, the epic race, I think it's going to change up things a lot. Any initial thoughts that you have after all of your reconning? I know that there's been a lot of uh, jumping out on course, checking out every little corner of it. Uh, what are you thinking? What's the uh, look at this epic race? I think it's going to be hard to break away. I think it's going to take teammates. I think you're going to have to work together uh, if you want to make this stick. So I'm really eager to see um, like next teams like Hexagon, teams like Wahoo Wakul, what they're going to do to work together to separate from the pack. So uh, this is actually, I'm really, really excited to see uh, the next guys. A lot of them are coached by Alex Co. who just, this is like his bread and butter. He's so excited about it. So um, just fatigue resistance, uh, who's going to burn the less, or, or at least amount of matches, I guess. So I think that's who is going to yeah. take away the win. Yeah, I think uh, as far as the idea of burning as little matches as you possibly can, things that make it a little bit more difficult for that, though, uh, Zwift have been nice enough to throw in, uh, and uh, they're definitely awesome and nice, but at the same time, the pressure of a $1,000 preem over the top of the Titans KOM, and that comes really early in the race and really late in the race. It could definitely throw a uh, cat amongst the pigeons a little bit there, perhaps, when it comes to trying to keep uh, as much energy reserves as you possibly can. Has that been thought a lot? I mean, in your planning, I mean, what that's, the racers are probably thinking a ton about whether or not they even go for that cash cream or reserve for a win, I would think. Yeah, but see, if you think about it, Nathan, if you have a team, then you can have one guy say who didn't do as well as they thought they would do in the previous race, who was maybe gonna go for uh, the GC standings you can have him chase down and and follow or follow attacks, you know what I mean? So that's why I'm saying like, if you look at the next guys, for instance, they sent, they had like what, six, seven guys in round two for the sprint. 
So, I mean, just their power alone to be able to bring stuff back and help, you know, if they choose to decide to help, you know, James Barnes, who did, who got his fourth overall, you know, um, is Brian Duffy Jr. going to help him out? So, I mean, it's just going to be a really interesting dynamic. I'm really eager to see how that plays out with the two primes. Yeah, that's a really good point. There's a lot of different dynamics that can play here as far as an overall objective for the whole overall championship that will be playing out throughout this race, as well as these preems that are on the line. And then the win on the day, which can fit itself in the middle of that overall objective. But at the same time, do the gloves come off when it comes to teammates or do the teammates all work together as it gets into those later parts of the racing? Whether or not breakaways are going to happen is going to be a big one. The jungle climb, I think uh, it, there's a little change up on the jungle climb too. You come through, you collect your power up through that lap banner and then there's a right hand turn actually that comes downhill and then they climb again. It makes it a little break in there, but a little bit longer of an effort at least. Yeah, I think, what is it? That jungle climb is how many kilometers? It's like five, uh, six kilometers long. Eight, eight, eight kilometers long all the way up. Pace is slow. It's very draftable for these guys, uh, but that is like really a place to just break, break everybody and just uh, honestly take it out of their legs before the second prime. So I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, that's going to be the main break point. Well, we're going to be getting over to our talent predictor, actually, with the studio. So as we're talking about who the favorites are, let's go ahead and take a look who the overall, overall picks are for our team. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Elise. No pressure on us then, because <laughs> we are very close to starting the race. But very quickly before we do, as Nathan said, our team of hosts and, anal and, and analysts have made our predictions for the Wahoo overall in advance of race one last weekend. I dread to say this, Danny, but let's see how we're getting on. <laughs> Here we are. Matt Stevens picked a very smiley looking line of Weirsan there, who is almost as close as you can get to the complete Zwift male athlete. He sits on top of the pile, so that unfortunately that does mean our mate Matt Stevens is on top of the pile, but more importantly, <laughs> Lionel Voyasan is himself. And it's a long game, let's not forget. In possession two, Nathan Guerra with Brian Duffy. He finished 22nd in last week's sprint championship. Mm. Our colleague, Hannah Walker, uh, is going to be joining us on commentary tomorrow, actually, it's Sunday for the women's race. She picked the world champion, Bjorn Andresen, and he sits right in the middle in third at the moment. Ollie Jones, my pick. I'm in fourth. I'm not too uh, worried about that right now. Unfortunately, he had that mechanical, didn't he, in race two, yeah. so he's going to come out all guns blazing yeah. tonight. As always, my pick has been the kiss of death to various athletes over the years, and in this opportunity, <laughs> it's Mikel Plantreau, the Frenchman riding for Hexagon. He is in fifth place of our best pick riders on 67 points. Oh dear, John Mould, position sixth, picking Ed Morgan, unfortunately, with only 40 points. Looked like he might have crashed there as well last yes. week, so hopefully he's recovered for this weekend's racing. I do hope so. John will be alongside me in the studio next weekend for the final weekend. Of course, don't forget, it's Saturday and Sunday night each of these weekends. And we'll track how these are doing on each race day as we indulge in some healthy competition amongst ourselves. But please do let us know your predictions in the chat. Yeah, I don't know how healthy it is. I find it, <laughs> I must admit, I find it quite painful at the best of times. We're all very competitive, <laughs> aren't we? Just a bit. Anyway, one more thing though, and I know I keep saying that, one more thing before we do get going. If you want to give a ride on to support the riders around you, open up your companion app and search for the rider you want. Today, we're going to go with Thomas Thrall. He's the Canadian eSports national champion and was eighth overall in the Zwift games after the sprint championships. So he's also someone that could really feature heavily today. So give him some ride-ons during the race. Absolutely. You can even follow him and favorite him as well, of course. Good luck. The racer who receives the most ride-ons during race one will wear our ride-on jersey in next weekend's climb racing action. So get those ride-ons in early. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the rider who's wearing it from last week, by the way, is Teppo Laurio. So watch out for him in that blue jersey. And uh, I'm pleased to say we are now ready to start the race. So we're going to hand you over to our commentary team, Nathan Guerra and Matt Stevens. Well, thank you very much indeed, Danny and Jez. Great intro to the show. 
this is going to be amazing. It really, really is. They've kicked off. There you go. Look at that total. Look at the chicken flag. 81.6 Ks to go. This is going to be very, very interesting indeed. Alongside me, of course, to talk us through, to run the rule over what's going to be happening on what will definitely be a fascinating race is Nathan Guerra. Nathan, last week was amazing. Some really entertaining racing. Um, some of the favourites went to the top. A few other favourites missed out. But... Um, this one completely different again. Um, and what, what are your thoughts on what may or may, may or not happen today? Because there are so many variables, mate, aren't there? Yeah, there are a ton of variables out here today, and uh, there is a lot. There are six climbs in total, right? I mean, we're going to hit up this uh, forward KOM right from the get go, and I think right from the get go here, we are going to get a really good idea of exactly what kind of race these riders want to ride. Uh, whether or not we have a really, really difficult climb right from the right from the outset, and depending on what teams we see pushing the pace, it's going to give us an idea of what their attitude is going to be from this race, and whether or not we're going to have a mainly conservative race up front until we see that thousand dollar cash premium, or if we got some of these teams out here saying, "Let's make it as hard as we possibly can." Indeed, well, it's great to see Michael Kaminsky in that golden jersey. ZG24, the Zwift Games 2024, that leader's jersey, golden shorts, golden bike, of course, as well. Um, looking resplendent, but uh, I rode this course earlier on. I'm, I've no doubt, Nathan, you've ridden this one as well. Um, this climb so early on, we go up it to the finish. Um, could see a few riders out the back because it's, a, it's definitely an early opportunity to split things up as they start to set the pace. There is Kaminsky. Look at that already. 600 watts just staying midway through the pack you can just see his golden jersey we've got around 110 starters today as you can just see all of their numbers scrolling along the bottom of the screen there's the stats on the right hand side as they round that first corner that's the steep part of the climb done as we heard before this climb should take these riders about one minute 30 seconds one minute 40 seconds and already we've got an early leader jasper Heyman, just moving off the front yeah, and it's up in these orange numbers a little bit here. We are seeing 182 beats per minute, I'm thinking here, from Heyman. Anderson, they're covering immediately the world champion, not letting anything get away. But the pack is definitely spread across the road, though, still. We will have a couple of stragglers out the back, perhaps, as the climb is very difficult up front. Those that really hate the climbing out here. But uh, I have a feeling uh, that, Matt, this is going to stick together for the upfront of this race. And really, a lot of these riders are going to be looking forward to that Titans growth, what I'm seeing here. A couple of presses over the front, though, perhaps to just, you could get a formation with a couple of riders punching over the top and some of the other riders saying, no, this is all going to come back together. Let's not risk too much. But with those early breakaway situations on a longer course like this, a lot of times you see that, don't you, Matt, where it's over and over again, you'll see these little attacks to see if something can form and the early stages of the race and be let go, give a little bit of a rope to work with. Yeah, definitely. We shall soon see. It's not very often we get races of this length uh, on Zwift. A real mixed bag after the three shorter events last week. We've got the epic climb next week, but this is something completely different. Now, we're relatively early, we've got that one rider that's just gone off the front. That's a Ruben Dont of Belgium. Now, this is a good opportunity as we look at the picture and picture of Morgen Christiansen just cruising along just towards the back there. The man from Denmark. This is a um, bit of a heads up, everybody. We do want you to get involved, not just in the comments on YouTube, not just in the ride-ons, of course. Please make sure you open up your companion app. But also, we want you to get involved in our brand new deck as well. We made a few tweaks this week. So back due to popular demand, it did do well last week, is the data dashboard, as I've just said. And as you'll see, we've also made some improvements for this epic race this week. Now, you can fire up the dashboard by pasting the link on screen into your browser or by clicking on the link in the chat. And just a reminder that it works best on Google Chrome. Right, let's explain quickly how it works. You'll see the three columns there. The left-hand column is going to show you groups on the road. A group will start when there's a gap of three or more seconds. Now, for each group, you can see the number of riders in that group and the average speed and the watts per kilogram of all the riders in the group. And you'll also be able to see the time gaps and the distance on the road in between each group. Now, this is going to be super useful for keeping track of the race and where everyone is on the road when things inevitably, one would imagine, especially given that final, they start to break up. Now, in the middle column, you'll be able to see which riders are in each group and all of their stats. Riders in each group are ordered by their bib numbers so they don't jump around on the screen. 
and you can use the arrows at the bottom to toggle through all of the riders and the groups in the field. And this will allow you to follow your favorite rider in detail throughout the race. Then on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see the live camera feed from our riders to watch, which you can see just there. And if you need any help navigating the dashboard, you can also find a handy guide on how it works by clicking the little question mark icon on the bottom right hand of the screen. So there is an in-depth look at our race dashboard giving you all the metrics you want so you really do feel involved as well but it does give you a great insight into what's going on yeah it really does i'm loving the ability to see everybody's uh current numbers as well as the placings out on course uh sometimes in pixel land we can get a little bit lost on on the scenes it helps a ton when it comes to figuring out exactly where the riders are standing at any moment and what kind of groups are starting to form. And it's also great to see those live cams and follow along with some of our favorite riders. Absolutely love to see that data out there today. So while we were uh, chatting about that, Matt, I saw a couple of moves actually specifically from Next, uh, presented by Insured there, Thomas Perrin, making a little bit of a move off the front and it was covered and he was with Daunt there for a second so it was hexaglan and neck both teams which do have a good amount of riders out here today trying to make smooth i also saw that restart and i'm hearing i've got a couple a little bit of insider knowledge actually but from a couple of the restart riders let me know that they've got some big plans and a good start list out here today and a newer name for some of those out there that may not know that raced with the echelon racing league as well as u.s nationals was hayden pucker actually a youngster from my state of wisconsin we call him farm watts he's out here today farm not farm. usually a sprinter not somebody who really's got much of a kick yeah he, he races from his farm and, <laughs> and and lives in definitely the cheese land of wisconsin that's for sure when it comes to hayden pucker he's got a lot of koms in my neighborhood when it comes to those those uh, those fields but this guy uh he is not the kind of rider who likes a sprint or a punch, but if he gets away, I mean, he's done really good at some gravel races, just the kind of that long go ruler. Watch out for Hayden Pucker, perhaps, for some breakaways today. Yeah, we're talking the breakaways. We've got an early one. It's you and Mackie. There he is, picture in picture. Just showing us his rather ripped calf muscles there, 480 watts. This is uh, a lot of power to sustain early on. Clearly an easy move. And with him for company, or they're not quite on the wheel, is at Mile Batty. He's about uh, just a couple of seconds off or less than that. If he just gets in that slipstream, we will have our first little breakaway of the day. And I tell you what, let, let's bring in Elise um, to give a little bit of insight into how she thinks things might go. Because Elise, lovely to have you on board for this week's show. Can't wait to get stuck in. But given the fact we've got these two preems, let's make no bones about it. Of course, everybody wants to win the race. There's the overall classification, but two sprints of a thousand bucks is super disruptive. Do you think some riders are going to come into this just with the sole aim of getting those and they're not so bothered about the race itself? What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, why not? If you know that you maybe don't have the endurance to be top three or you just, you know, don't don't think you can make it, yeah, absolutely, in the, in the front pack, then why not? What's stopping you to go all out for that first one? Or making the race extremely hard for others. So you're seeing this from Ewing, um, Ewing, Ewing, Ewing. Um, he's going right off the front right here. He's making it hard. Um, others are having to counter and work just as hard for that. Um, you're also seeing it on um, like Pavit is going to probably equally make the race hard. He didn't pr uh, participate in the race before. So people like that who are super, super strong, great Zwifters, great Zwiftcraft are, I mean, just going to smash it from here up until yeah, you get to the Titans reverse. Yeah, I think you had a really good prediction, Elise, on next presented about in short here because they have continued to throw. It looks like Thomas Perrin is going to be their early breakaway, man. They have, they set Mackey off the front after him, but it looks like there's a one-two situation going on here, at least between Thomas Perrin and Ewan Mackey, both from next presented about in short. And I have a feeling that they're trying to send those two riders off the front continually because they're no longer really involved I don't think at the at the high level of the overall any longer. So since that's no longer a concern for them, next presenter I'm sure looking to pick up a couple of 1K bonuses here with Perrin or perhaps Mackie getting a breakaway, thinking, well, not going to be involved in the later half. We're going to work for James Barnes most likely. So that looks like the the call you made early on is working out. 
Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, like if you don't have a strong rider in the group stay on next who maybe won't be able to stay with the group, what prevents them from just going off the front early on and getting that extra time, making it up the climb, and then they can assist one of the, you know, one of their teammates later on after the, you know, first con reverse. So, I mean, this is just so strategic. Um, team tactics here are going to play in a huge, like, very important role, and I'm excited. I don't know. I hope everyone's ready. I'm ready. Yeah, this is good stuff. Well, uh, thanks so much, Lise. Great uh, look here at the early breaks. Let's jump back over with Matt here. As Matt, I'm seeing, uh, you know, we were talking about maybe things staying a little bit calm, maybe a little, you know, not necessarily... Uh, open it up too much early on, but uh, when you have Leonard Tugels covering moves early on, or even trying to make moves early on, that kind of changes the whole game plan and story, I think, here, Matt. Oh, totally. With, with 73k to go, I was, just as you were talking there with Elise, I was looking at the speed. It's hardly dropped below 48ks an hour. On the approach to the tunnels, it was 51k an hour. This has been rattled off at a very high pace. In addition to Leonard Tugel shutting the gap, we also saw the likes of Freddie Ovet go clear. He just opened up a couple of seconds gap too before being uh, reabsorbed. So still a long, long way to go um, as they just go underneath the ocean. And it won't be, be, be long before they're actually on the Titans Grove with that preem. That comes at 16.2 Ks to go. And of course, it's a climb that we talk about all the time. It's one of those difficult climbs to pace right. It ebbs and flows. But if you've got good Zwift craft, you can really actually try and recover on that climb because it goes up in little pitches i think if you can ride this climb right you can actually save a lot of energy as opposed nathan to those who can't quite ever get that climb dialed yeah the front of the race right now is absolutely insane here matt the, 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 we've got uh it was the coal here with the uh the Valtenir, as well as have vote putting out over seven watts per kilogram continually pretty much for insane. the last minute or so <laughs> one nine i mean insane effort here gamps is going across barry's going across now this got me thinking of those uh longer stages uh that you've commentated on many a times where eventually the break does come when there's an extremely motivated pack to form one and the and the rest of the pack says enough is enough can't chase this down any longer and it looks like after about four attempts at this point, we've got about six or, let's see here, I think seven riders off the front. We've got Max Preserving Short. We've got um, Hexagon involved with two riders. We've got Abus Lacole in there as well. We've also got BL13. I mean, this is uh, definitely something that the pack might sit up and let go here to battle it out for that first one game. No, definitely. It's a really interesting group. Uh, but uh, uh, Jez will be jumping around in his booth because he's got Michael Plantereur up in the move as well. Plantereur, a very good rider. We saw him come to the form of the Zwift Games. Uh, Michael Gamet just rolls off the front. There he is. The man from uh, Norway, from or should I say from Denmark, just drifting off the front. The Frenchman just behind. And as you quite rightly said, there's seven riders who have about seven seconds on the bunch behind. Jimmy Kershaw leading the pack behind as they head on and not too long before they get into the, those rolling roads just on the approach to Titans Grove itself. But uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether these riders are just trying to clip clear just to see what sort of move they can get onto the gravel on the right-hand side. That added little bit of rolling resistance here. But no, you're quite right. We've seen it out, on, out in real life. Super, super aggressive racing. I did think we might see an aggressive race, but not as aggressive as this. But look, that break has been taken back. That was deemed quite clearly to be too, too dangerous. And just look at the way this pack, Nathan, is spread all across the road. Yeah, I just did say uh, our current overall leader, Mikhail Kaminsky, was the one who closed that down, actually. The rest following his wheel. And then over the top, it was Peniza as well as by Daunt. So Kaminsky actually taking the bull by the horn says, OK, I'm not going to let this go. I'm the overall leader. I'm not sure. Does he, he, does he have the teammates here to work with him necessarily to bring anything back? I'm not sure. I think he's a little bit solo out here today. So Kaminsky just says, I've got to bring this back. I can't let seven go up the road. I wonder if we're going to see that from him throughout the race here, that he's going to have to play his own team in some ways in order to make sure that the race doesn't get out of hand because he has to think about taking the win or a top three, a top five overall uh, here today in order to continue to hold on to that yellow jersey. Yeah, golden jersey, I should say. probably say. Yeah, the, the golden jersey. It's going to take a little while to get used to that, but the golden jersey sat in the pack. Another little move goes clear. It's Ed Morgan who just drifted off the front. 
of course, uh, John Mould's tip. So good to see Morgan just moving through to the front. Won't be long before the road just starts to pitch up. We just saw the, the distance to the top of the climb, five kilometres. That's where they get the first power up of the day. And that's an interesting one as well, isn't it? We've got the longest race we've had for a long time on Zwift. 70 k's to go now, Nathan, but only two power-ups. And as I was saying before, I wrote this earlier on, and um, I, was, I was in this race. I was about, I don't know, 30th, 40th place. I held on to my power-up towards the end. And I, and I think the use of power-ups today, considering there's only, tr- uh, there's only two, could be quite interesting as we see Avo drifting off the front here. Yeah, well, now Hexagon continue to just make these moves over and over again. Really interesting to see here from Hexagon because it seems to me that they're extremely motivated to try and make something happen. Great to see from them. And I am seeing on the front of the pack, it's actually Leonard Tugels only doing 4.2 watts per kilogram, 8.7 currently from Sebastian Havo. So definitely all in. This is a bottom to top move because really, even though this isn't the start of the KOM banner at this point, for this Titans Grove. This is essentially from here to the top of that KOM. It is uphill. It's rolling as they make their way into Titans Grove here, but it's definitely the the lowest elevation we'll see until we hit that uh, banner where there is a big cash prize. Two riders now trying to go across. It looks like one from WLC, and it looks like that is also going to be the Italian Ricardo Peniza, and Peniza definitely one of those riders who likes the race to be hard. Not necessarily yep. sprinters are trying to perhaps get a little bit of distance with Hovo at this point, Matt, before they actually get into the proper sprint. Yep, this is this little rolling section up and down. You get 100 meters up, 100 meters down. The general elevation, as you were saying, is rising all the way to the top of Titans Globe, Grove where we have that power up available. But importantly, for a lot of riders here and quite clearly for the Frenchman who's got a three and a half second lead, he's clearly going for that thousand dollar pre and then we get that again just on the run in we co-op titans grow from the other direction there's another thousand dollars so different team tactics playing out a couple of riders clearly going to sacrifice themselves to get this one make no bones about it three k's to go but a full out effort in a race this long is going to be hard for anybody to recover so this is avo all in for this climb now nathan isn't it yeah, and you can see Peniza almost on his wheel here. And that would be actually really... No, that's a question mark, right? There's $1,000 at the top of this climb. Do you like it that you have someone to work with when you've got 10 seconds in the pack? Or are you like, no, really? why'd you got to join the party right now, buddy? <laughs> because I went all in with my aces here. And, oh, man, they're getting to, uh, into this climb. And they've got 11 seconds. I'm not sure they're coming back because they are pulling a solid six to seven. They may be able to do this to the top. They might start working together here, or now it looks like they're just looking at each other. This gets a little dangerous, but Peniza goes right over the top now. Straight over the top, and it says looking good, isn't it? They've got 11 and a half seconds, as you can see. The time gap's on to the right-hand side. Perrin is up there as well. A couple of other riders just moving through to the front. Old Comio is there, but 2.3 k to go. So at the kind of speed they're riding at the moment, that's still going to be a good four minutes of effort. They're hovering around 30, 35 k's now, maybe a little bit more. It's a long, long way, and there's a lot of firepower still behind. Remember, no power-ups to be deployed just yet. The first one is over the top of this climb, but those two riders are holding some enormous numbers to try and stay clear. 390 watts, that's six watts a kilo. We know that not many riders can ride for more than five or six minutes out at these sort of numbers, but it's now Pinizza who goes clear. Just starting to distance the Frenchman is the Italian. And look at the face on Pinizza there and he's still after the top of this going to have 65 k's to go totally all in he's going to need to bang some gels down and that is uh, something we might talk about a little bit later is the various fueling strategies on such a challenging day but they're still clear still holding a gap of 11 and a half seconds Nathan yeah, and Havo, it looks like, just able to hold on there, just barely. Peniza now is sitting right at that 11 seconds, you were saying. And it's kind of this ebb and flow even for myself right now as I'm watching this play out in front of me. I look at go, I look at come back one, I'm like, oh, no, it's not going to happen. because. And then it goes back out to 12 now. It's back and forth with this little bit of timing as they try to play that knife's edge of holding on to this gap to get up and over the top because that 10 seconds 
can disappear so quickly in a full-on uphill gallop that we're going to see, especially this kind of a KOM map, because there is extremely draft. You said you raced this or rode this. Uh, well, it was. I, I, mean, I assume you raced it a little bit, right? A little bit competitive up over the top of this uh, climb, I, and you I, can I, definitely hang on to a draft, can't you? Oh, definitely. Especially you get a lot of momentum because of the nature of this climb, save for the final part to the line where it drags up for about three, about four or five hundred meters without any dips. You can, if you ride it well, there's another little dip here. This is where the time section of the climb is. You can actually get that slingshot effect. And of course, that's doubled up if you get your drafting right. But Pinitza said we've got 850 meters to go. This could get a little bit cagey. They've got 10 and a half seconds. They're, they're traveling about 37 Ks now. They've probably got about a minute of effort as Pinitza continues to pile on the pressure. 670 watts, 10 watts a kilo here. This is absolutely sensational. The gap holding, but it's coming down now. The bunch really starting to pick things up with 600 meters to go towards the top of the climb. Oh, it's so close here, and it's actually his countryman, Savannah, who's on the front at 8.2 watts per kilogram, who really wants this one, it looks like, as well. It's nine to seconds here still. They may be able to hold on. It's going to be touch and go right to the line, I think. Now they're starting to play a little bit of a games with each other, because the question is, will Paniza continue to just pull Havo up while he sacrifices himself for maybe nothing here, as Anderson now comes over the top. Nine watts per kilogram from the world champion as well, trying to get across to these two. They've got it within sight, $1,000, eight seconds up the Road, it's going to be Havo who goes 14 watts per kilogram up ahead here now at this point to try and get this. And it looks like it's going to be Havo unless some sort of miracle from the pack or Paniza. Wow, this is amazing. Havo has gone. Look at the face of the Frenchman. 800 watts. He's going to take it. Nobody can stop the Frenchman as he romps to the top of Titans Grove. $1,000 in the bag for the Frenchman. That's good enough for a mini win in the back pocket. Straight off the power. Zero watts. Punches the air with delight. Evo draws first blood, and there it is. Prem number one winner. 1,000 bucks in the back pocket. But boy, did he have to work for that one. Super, super stuff there, Nathan. Oh, that was amazing. I mean, honestly, uh, the games that were played there, and he got a little, I mean, Peniza came across to him. You got to feel a little bit, right? Just a little yeah. bit, because there was so much work. Oh, over the top here, our current leader, Kaminsky. I they're not playing around over the top here. This might be a launch pad. There's absolute separation. There's some serious names up here. Ovet, it looks like uh, Anderson is here. Vahil, Havo is now here as well. I think this probably comes to back together unless there's some motivation up here. I mean, these are no joke names that are at the front right now, Matt. Now, this is fair. Look at Tom Thrall here. Bjorn Andreessen, the world champion. We've got the Canadian champion. We've got the man in the gold jersey. A masterclass, Jesse. And Kaminsky already has used that draft power up. That just shows how hard it was. A lot of draft power has been used as Kaminsky fires himself through to the front. Clearly, no mistake, deploying that early on. And again, it's an ideal opportunity to go over the top. The pack were going so hard over the top. This is where the riders with that real deep ability, that real deep endurance, uh, can uh, flourish. Let's have a look at the gaps. It's still all together, but that was a very good move. And as you quite rightly pointed out, Nathan, the cream really did rise to the top. And as we take a breath and look at the, this, uh, this beautiful looking peloton descending down the other side of Titans Grove, we still have 64 kilometers to go. Yes, you heard that right. 64 Ks to go, Nathan. Wow. Strap yourselves in. I'm exhausted already, but this has been a great race so far, especially with the addition of that pre. Yeah, that was absolutely awesome to see the way that those riders went over the top there, taking that Prem Havo and the way that the separation happened there. I think we're just getting a little bit of hint of the excitement to come. Well, as we're looking at Kaminsky here, let's go ahead and take a chat or, or take a listen into uh, a little bit of ideas from him about how he took on that first sprint race and some of his tactics to get that win. I'm super happy uh, that I won sprint championships. Uh, I'm not a good sprinter uh, because I'm not able to generate uh, big numbers on a short of period of time. On the first uh, second race, I was afraid that uh, because I can't uh, promote to last race because in the second race, uh, sprint was really demanding and long. But uh, on third uh, race, I. Uh, made the decision to change uh, a little of my tactic and made pressure of the competitors, but it didn't work. So I made the decision to go all out on the uh, last K and 
it works uh, like you saw, I hope. <laughs> Uh, so uh, now I'm first position and uh, I will give my best to secure my first position on the overall classification. Uh, two next races are also demanding, but I will give my best and uh, promise you that I will give you golden show on the next races. Oh, great to hear. Yes, great to hear from the man there. It really was a golden show, wasn't it? And here's another man, not in gold, but the man from Finland, Teppo Lorio. There he is, always sporting, well, great hair. Whether it's on his chin, his top lip, or his head, always got great hair. Big fan favourite, Teppo Lorio, wearing that blue ride-on jersey. There he is, drifted off the front. Remember, it wasn't just about the blue jersey. Teppo Lorio was third in Glasgow yesterday, or last week, should I say, behind Kaminsky, just behind Vidal Melt. Um, so it's drifted off the front there. So it's a timely reminder, folks, to fire up your companion apps. Choose the riders that you think have earned a ride on. Or if you're just feeling generous, give everybody a ride on as well. It might make your thumbs a bit sore, but it is all about the community. We've seen that literally thousands of you out on the roads of Zwift this week, um, riding on the course of the Zwift Games. Me included this morning. It was great to see so many of you out there. So now you're relaxed uh, with your feet up watching this race please do get involved and also get involved in the comments on youtube as well well i think it's time to bring in elise again elise at this point in the race do you think things will settle down because they, they can't just race so fast and furiously for, for, for that amount of time and looking at the profile of the race before we head into the jungle lap this is the most the flattest part of the course now isn't it? it's gently undulating but relatively flat lots of opportunity to sit in the wheels and recover for the final part of the race. Yeah, the, this is the men's race. I mean, it's just always attack after attack. It's never boring, which is why I just love it. You can see Teppo uh, just going off the front. His uh, other Wahoo local uh, friend is just right over. Uh, Josh Power is helping him out there. I mean, yeah, here goes another attack right now. Um, up off the front. So, I, I mean, it's just so undulating. People are just going to try to either break the path away or just split it down. The fewer, less people that can get in that front path, the better for them. So, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, just over this next, what, 20 kilometers we have here, uh, what everyone's going to be doing and pushing the pace. Yeah, at least let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, a lot of people would say a little bit flatter through this next course here on the coast, uh, but some people might see that as an opportunity to make things really, really fast. There are a couple little bumps through the coast as well. And, I mean, I have noticed that Wahoo LaCole was not involved at all at the front end of the uh, race until after Titans Grove, actually. As soon as that cash premium was picked up, bam, Teppo Lorio's on the front, Josh Power's on the front. I mean, that's kind of a no-joke situation here. We've got Movistar also starting. They weren't involved at all early on, so it looks like a couple of teams – had a plan, perhaps at least, to just let that all play out. It's all going to come back together. Let them go for mm -hmm. that and burn matches. And now let's take advantage of that situation. See, and what's that about here? Objectives on course might be able to be used to your advantage if you think others are going to go for them. Right, exactly. Like right here, we have how many? One, two, three, four, five. Just five guys up the front. Now, if they were all on the same team, that weren't something to kind of attack onto but right now anything is going to get brought back absolutely so i don't think the race is actually going to be starting if you want to say until about 40 41 kilometers into it so once we hit that jungle um loop area that's when i think people need to make sure you're fueling right correctly through all these little mini attacks uh, nutrition is just going to play a pivotal role for most of these guys sweating sodium content carbs make sure they're really getting that down and in right now um as most of them are yeah well there's kind of many attacks going on but when that pace settles in get those carbs in yeah it's a big one as well as uh the riders are going to need to make sure they are absolutely fueling with the kind of attacks that are happening here let's head back over with uh matt as matt you were chatting about that a little bit but to give the viewers an idea of how many carbs that need to be consumed, especially at this kind of high power, Matt, what, I mean, what, uh, you're, you're think 60, I think is the minimum 60 grams per hour, the minimum, because these kind of matches being burned. I mean, this is just nonstop burning that kind of fuel in the legs. 
Yeah, definitely. And we talked about at the top of the show, um, Jez and Danny were talking about there's a real mix of riders here. Well, there will be for the whole of the Zwift Games of riders that have excelled on the road. Leonard Turgles is probably the most accomplished rider on the road in this field. Um, so he'll be used to this sort of distance. But as you say, it's the intensity. So they'll be dipping in and out. They'll be trying to recover as much as they can. Um, but a lot of the time, they'll be burning glycogen. I mean, so that they, that they will be, <laughs> they'll be burning uh, fuel, through their fuel stores very, very quickly. So it could be as much as 60 to 80. We know riders on the road now are over 100 grams an hour, over five or six hours. Um, to put it into a little bit of perspective, I rode at 292 watts for two hours, and I burnt 2,200 calories. Uh, today and I was I was banging gels down in in a, in a group that was pretty hard for me. So you, you, I think today, given the intensity these runs are going to be out, they're going to be burning around. I would estimate about two and a half, maybe two thousand seven hundred calories, depending on the weight of these riders here. So so a big calorie intake, uh, and also as well, I was absolutely caked in salt as well. So okay, a half an hour, forty minute race is a completely different. Um, fueling proposition than a race of this distance. So, yeah, cooling strategies have got to be there. The riders are going to have to have several bottles wrapped up as uh, racked up as well, especially if they're riding on their own and haven't got anybody to, to feed them, as it were. So they're going to have to really make sure that their fueling strategy, their cooling strategy, their hydration strategy are bang on today. Because if you enter that last 10 or 15 Ks and you've run out of fluids, uh, it could be game, game over. Yeah, I'm looking at the group now at this point. It looks like we've got a split. 83, 84 riders, make, 83 riders, I think it is, that have made the lead group at this point. There is a chase, well, a solo chase with the rock off the back now at this point. And then a chase group from what I'm seeing of one, two, three, four, five, six riders. So a little bit of a split, it looks like. Uh, not anything extremely major, but uh, because of the incessant pace that has been set at the front with attacks like we're seeing here from Severa Gottwald, uh, a few m moments ago we saw Freddie Ovet looking to go across to an attack from Teppo Lorio and Cruz. So this has been non stop. I don't think that this is going to slow down, actually. No. Uh, I mean, maybe <laughs> right before we hit the climb, but it seems to me that. There's extreme motivation to not bring this pack to the bottom of a minute and a half, minute and 40 climb at the end of this race. Yeah, I, I'm just looking at some of the stats. You can just see that we had that lovely aerial shot, didn't we, of the peloton as they were moving along as the pack was just broken up. It wasn't one big blob of we've seen, uh, we see so many times on some of the longest races. This is super aggressive. And as Elise was saying, there's little groups going off left, right and center. And because I think we're in relatively uncharted territory and we don't often race this sort of distance, um, you can just throw the kitchen sink at it. I mean, you, there's a risk reward thing going on here. You, you know that you can't sustain five or six or, or six watts a kilo for one and three quarter hours, which is, I think is going to be the time they're going to be spending on the bikes today out on this particular course. But um, there's going to be riders that are willing to take risks. Freddie Ovet there sat in the middle of the pack. The power's just dropped. But it's been just a few moments ago, the, the, I was looking at the likes of James Barnes, Kaminsky, Leonard Turgles. They were all riding at around 400 watts. We've still got 56 Ks to go. So these riders already are burning through matches. There's, there's, uh, this is ex exceptionally hard. And when you look at what we've got on the final lap, I do love this course. It's so well created. The double punch twice up the uh, the Zwift KO1 once in reverse and then the traditional time um, for the finish. It's going it's to be very, very hard. So, But again, what you can't afford to do, Nathan, is miss any splits, especially when you see riders of the caliber of Barnes, Kaminsky, Turgles going clear. You have to react to that, but that comes at a cost. Cohen here for a moment, interesting enough, a little bit of a sprint off the front. Was that a TV time sprint to get the fastest through segment? Because he got 31.24 and everybody else no went 33.38. So <laughs> there was no money on us. So he was just like, hey, I'm going to get some TV time here. It looks like nice job to Cohen off the front from the Toyota Cryo RDT team. As he uh, made a little bit of a move there. It looks like going backwards now at this point. But uh, nice little kick. And uh, maybe that's for a setup here for somebody else to go off the front. I'm seeing that blue jersey again on the front here. Tepo Lorio is just nonstop. Yeah. Now we really are looking at Holden Camus here. This is a rider. Now, this is an interesting one. He did make it into the final. Uh, yep. But ended up the race ended up being so hard that he was not able to in that final race in Glasgow last week uh, really to... 
I think, use his full sprint. And this course now, uh, Matt, I, I'm wondering, you know, it's going to be a tough one for a pure sprinter like him. I think he's trying to do, today it's kind of like get the best he possibly can out of this for a solid overall. Yeah, I mean, he was, I think he was ninth or 10th just on the top of my head. He did start to struggle. And, and it was a real, you know, although there were quite explosive races, it was called the sprint for a reason. They were short, explosive. The accumulation of effort, in the end, I think they were racing for about an hour and a half at a very high level, almost like a, the kind of effort that you'd put out in a long cyclocross race or, or a city centre criterion. Uh, it started to fade. And I think a course like this as well, given the finish that we've got, the fact it's up, it's up a climb isn't going to suit the pure, pure sprinters and the fact that they're... Um, their resources are going to be depleted. People are going to be tired. And I think the sort of aggressive race we've seen so far, I think some teams have got stuck in just to sap the strength from some of the sprinters who might need to try and play a canny game. And if you're constantly on and off the power, that really does start to sap sap the strength. As we get a little reminder there of the Zwift Games uh, race dashboard, please do get involved. Click on that link, paste it into your browser, and there's a real rich set of metrics in there. Um, for which you to uh, to have a look, pick the riders that you want to look at. As a, a brief uh, b- bit of a blobbing there, that was the first, that's the the most compact I've seen the bunch. But again, as soon as it gets compacted, Nathan, there's another attack off the front, and it's a Leon Gottwald followed by Michael Gamps, Matt Wright in there as well, Aaron De Hont. Another acceleration. There's never too much of an opportunity for riders to fully rest here at all. No, there's not. There definitely is not. And this may be a good time to bring in. Uh, some predictions here as we're getting into almost 30k down with White Severa uh, as well as Oregon. I saw Gamps. There's Gamps really well known for his breakaway, being a breakaway specialist. But uh, Elise, let's bring in Elise here for a moment. I want to, you know, we are seeing a poll over on YouTube right now. There is a live poll. Solo breakaway, breakaway group, or a bunch sprint. And it's pretty even the last time I saw it. 33%, 38% breakaway group was winning. Uh, bunch sprint at 29%. So it's pretty even across the board. Almost split up in about 35, 35, 35-ish there. So, uh, Elise, do you want to you want to throw your hat in the ring here for a prediction already? Or you know, she's like, no, oh, it's too early. Too Don't early. do this to me. Okay. All right. Here, here we're going to get. Okay. So I'm going to say, oh, look, there's another attack. You know, th- these guys are just so well aware of it. But I want y'all to also recognize these guys who are just sitting at the back, just sitting back there. And just doing, like, I've been watching Brian Duffy Jr., um, uh, Josh Harris, are literally just sitting at the back with minimal watts per kg while everyone else is, like, going up and attacking, attacking, lighting the match, lighting the match. Those, uh, those, like, athletes are the ones who we need to be watching after the second prime. And I think that they're going to be ready to go. They're going to be ready to go off the front because they're going to be fresh. And that's what I'm the most excited about to see. So it could be, you know, like I said, if the, if there's a bunch of next guys who are fresh, they're going to just go off and they could just do like a TT together. Or if it's someone else you just form an alliance with on the spot, then so be it. But I think it might go down to like, you know, five or six guys. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there. I'm going to go with chat as well. What was currently winning at that breakaway group. We'll see if we're too much of an influence on the poll. <laughs> Just I know, minute. I but, know. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, <laughs> I think, you know, but it's a good point. I was watching that as well. And one of my dark horse picks actually was going to be Josh Harris. And the fact that him and Brian Duffy Jr. are sitting in the pack yes. as well as I haven't seen James Barnes really stick his nose in the wind as well. There's some big names. I mean, we've been chatting a lot about what all the attack after attack. Tugels is doing this. I mean, of course, people are going to respond to a, a, a rider like Planthro or Tugels who have won a lot of Zwift Grand Prix. But, you know, here, I think that there are definitely some riders that are just letting the pack do what it does as well as using teammates to bring things back. There's some stories playing out in the pack that have not really been opened up yet, it seems like, at least. Exactly. And, and that's why it's so important to form these alliances, to have people bring those back for you so they can't get away. So I'm sure I'm giving away everything for the women's race tomorrow. But, you know, if if you don't have a, a good support network, you better believe a lot of them are texting and forming those alliances right now as we speak. Yeah, 100%. Well, I, you know, I'm going to go back to Matt here because, Matt, I want to talk a little bit like in real life Peloton. 
that is, you're not texting while you're, I mean, you know, we're seeing all this texting oh. happening while people are on the bike here in Zwift. I don't think anyone's texting, but there's definitely some chat going on. I would think about like, Hey, are we going to work together? What's happening here? I mean, how does that play out in real life versus what's happening here in Zwift? Do you think? Yeah. I mean, this um, communication um, is, is a little bit more to communication IRL because you'll be communicating with your team car via race radio, but also in a breakaway, you can, you can talk to your, to, to the guys or the girls in, in the break with you. But here, of course, you can talk to your teammates and your, and your DS, your team manager, but what you can't do is directly communicate with your rivals unless they happen to have another, another channel, another Discord channel or a WhatsApp with all the rivals in it. I can't see that happening. Generally, all of the communication is inter-team. So that's the one thing that separates it. But what you need then because of that is just this innate instinct on how to ride in a group on Zwift. And that only comes with time. And when you look at the evolution of racing on Zwift over the last few years, riders are are clearly getting stronger and stronger. The, the talent pool is deeper and deeper, just like it is out on the road. But um, understanding how to communicate, understanding how to ride on a wheel, understanding when you know that a brake is going to go clear, understanding how to ride through and off can take quite a lot of time to master on Swift. And I don't think anybody will ever really master it. It's a constant learning curve. Uh, but yeah, the unique thing about uh, racing on Swift is you cannot directly communicate uh, verbally with your rivals. So you just have to learn how to ride with them. And that's a really lovely feeling. And the, the, the better at that you, you, you get, the more accomplished a rider you are and more you can use that to your advantage as uh, we hit now that magical number that a lot of these runs will be more than happy with, 50 kilometers to go. Been racing for around 41 minutes. And there we go, 49.9 Ks to go. Great to see how many ride-ons you guys are giving. And please keep continuing. There will be a cutoff point for the ride-on jersey. Um, I think that comes when we hit the jungle as we head into the final phase of the race. But there is the golden jersey of our Polish leader, Michael Kaminski, sat pretty 39 k's an hour, so the speed has just dropped a little bit. But just, I tell you what, Nathan, I'll get, I'll get enthralled. I will throw my hat in the ring. I think there's going to be a breakaway. I think, I think the second time up Titans Grove with the extra thousand bucks, that's going to thin things out. That will see a reduced peloton. And I also think that final double punch, the two climbs, the reverse climb of the, the Zwift KOM with the really steep slopes. It's a longer climb, but it has a steeper section in it. I think that will split it up, and I think we might see a group of, I don't know, 7, 8, 10 go through to the finish. That's my call on that one anyway. Yeah, it's a, it's a great call, actually. And I think that there's a lot of riders who are really happy looking forward to this longer climb out of the jungle, but I think they're happy because they know it's going to make the race hard. Right? So there's riders who are sitting in look, looking at this going and hoping that the race is just going to be really, really hard, but not necessarily because they're like, I'm going to break away here. And a lot of times you you look, oh, yeah, there's a great spot on course. But when you're to, to try and maybe make a break or something like that, but when you have parity across the entirety of a race group like this amongst a peloton that is this strong, you know it's going to take a lot more than just one eight-minute climb to break your rivals that you need to win against. And so you're looking at that more as a softening up the legs. Well, now look at this, though. Again, we've got what it looks like, another six riders trying to make a break off the front. So there's also some other risk-reward going on here as well with some of these riders that may be thinking, my only chance is to get into a breakaway. My only chance is at a minute and a half to a minute 40 up against a rider like Tugles, Plantherol, Brian Duffer Jr., I'm not going to win it out right there, but perhaps if I can get off the front in a breakaway, play my cards right, there's a good chance that I'm going to be able to get a high placing or even the, a, a win on the day if they let us go. So if the racing gets hard enough and some of these riders back there trust too much in bringing things back, could end up in a situation with the break off the front. And I think that's why we see these attacks over and over again because there's riders who want to take that chance, isn't there, Matt? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the amount of time they're going to be spending on the bikes today and on this, this long race. Remember, 81 and a half Ks. It's a long time for, for racing, for virtual racing, for esports. It really, really is. And, and as you quite rightly said, we saw, I think it was only about a minute, we saw the shape of the peloton completely change. It all bunched up. We had about a minute and then they were off again. Nobody want, they, they want to, there's a lot of riders here that want to make it as hard as they can. So the riders have got that high 
power to sorry that, that the high power to weight ratio you, the, the ideal the, the ideal power to weight is the minimum of the, is, is the lowest number at the end so that's that's when you've managed to rest up and ride smart but there are some sections of road here that you can make it really hard and and the jungle climb as we were talking about right at the top of the program at least pointed out it's it's about seven or eight k's long okay there are some little drops there but you've got the added tackiness of that surface as well and again riding it today I've, I've not ridden it for a while and it's like well this is actually pretty hard although you still get the draft effect on the climb it's a proper climb and if there's a few riders that want to make it really really hard not necessary to snap the elastic uh, it could soften riders up for the finale for sure as we get a picture and picture of ed laverack former british hill climb champion out on the road classy classy rider and a couple of riders just going clear here ed morgan is being joined uh, by sergey uh, Ponoshkinov, Freddy, oh, Freddy Ovet also in the mix as well. You see some big hitters just drifting off the front. They've opened up a second and a half lead, but I tell you what, that's been brought back very quickly. You don't want to let the likes of Freddy Ovet go clear this early on in the race, that's for sure. But everybody is sniffing out opportunities here. And, and just to finally answer your question, uh, Nathan, as soon as it eases, riders are going to want to try and take that opportunity to go here to try and force a little bit of a split why not take that opportunity and you might end up in a breakaway that's a little bit further up the road which might in turn see you at the front of the race in the final so there's loads of different ways this can play out and that's why i think we're seeing such an aggressive race so far actually let's bring in elise again just to see what her general thoughts are we're not even quite halfway yet we'll be there in about three or four k's time elise but um what are your thoughts on the way the race is? Has it surprised you or did you expect it to be as aggressive as it's been so far as we see Ed Morgan just drifting off the front here? Right, exactly. I, I We fully expected this. You see, an, oh, here goes another attack, um, Freddie Obet. Yeah, I mean, just counter after counter, making it hard for those people who aren't on a team, like I mentioned before, um, and just really tiring people out. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the likes of Thrall again, uh, or, you know, Thrall's bringing back attacks, but going up the climb for the second prime. Um, Hexagon, Havo again. I mean, he's so strong. He's just, I just, I love that guy. I follow him all the time and his whiff craft is absolutely amazing. But Thrall, if y'all remember from the Canadian eSports uh, championship, just came back and just demolished everybody. So excited to see um, his attack up here. And look, we have one just getting away with two seconds. So this is this is good. I'm excited. What do you think, Nathan? Yeah, Thomas Perrin here now on the move. A teammate of Thomas Thrall, actually. And Perrin here, I think, is a rider who wants a solo breakaway. He can hold a very high pace for an extremely long period of time. I know that this is a rider that uh, likes this kind of a situation. Now, I, this may be a little bit of a bait, though, as well. We do see Zach Near, teammate, going to the front yeah. and backing off immediately to three watts per kilogram. So uh, the pack is most likely not going to like that very much. I mean, Perrin is, at least Perrin is currently doubling the watts per kilogram of the pack right now. Yeah. You know, we haven't really seen much of Zach Near yet, which is also another big name. Uh, you know, expecting great things from him as well. So... Another person who I expect to fully just be drafting in the in the pack right now, um, and you know after that second prime, uh, see him just explode and go with the with the front group. I wouldn't be surprised one bit. Hundred percent. Well, now Tom Corrigan going across. It looks like the action's kicking off again here. Let's bring it back here to Matt as uh, Gottwald now looks to go across. Perrin is off the front by three seconds. A couple of riders to jump across to him to try and form something. A lot of times, Matt, when you, you do get out there solo, what's going on in your head is like, do you want to just be all alone or do you want a couple to come across to you and you try and just get that gap and then get into a steady rhythm and trust perhaps that a couple of riders will jump across? You know, it's kind of this, uh, for me, I, 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 I'm like, all right, yeah, someone's coming across, great, but then you see the motivation from the pack to come across as well and you're like, oh, that shut it down. It's kind of this, look, that's why it's such a gamble, isn't it, Matt? You've got to try um, for, the, for the reasons that we've already talked about. And again, look at the way the shape of the bunch has changed again. You know, riders, this will mean just that strong out effect means that riders, even midway through the peloton, they'll still be getting that little bit of a draft, but they'll be having to keep that chain nice and tight. There'll be another spike in power. Uh, Leon Gottwald there having to kick out 400 watts to stay in front. But 
at this stage of the race, we're still just under 44 k's to go. Anybody going clear on their own, uh, unless they're going for the for, for the for the Titans Grow Prem, um, is it's all about trying to go clear and try and provide the catalyst for riders to come across to try and form a breakaway. Nobody. Um, and, and even Tali Pogaccia, for example, I think uh, if he came and raced on Zwift, he wouldn't actually want to want to break clear uh, on your own. It's so, so hard because of the way the pack dynamics work here. And there's still a lot of hungry riders there. The, the quality of this build is so, so high that if you do go clear, for me, the mindset is I'm willing to sacrifice two or three minutes off the front. But the idea is to actually formulate and let a break start to coalesce. And that's exactly what we've seen here. Jacob Bjorkland is there. Thomas per Perrin, the man who started this one off. He's been roomed. He's been joined by Liam Gottfeld. So we've got five riders off the front. Now, Tolbert is there as well from the United States of America. And then uh, from America. And they've now built a five or six seconds lead. So this little move... It's just an exact example of what your question was about. It's about trying to entice riders to jump across and then start working together and then force the peloton onto the back foot, of course, depending on the permutation out in front. So this is a nice little move. Six seconds is the lead now. Yeah, and it's right before the climb, which makes it really interesting because if they've got the power to work together and really jump uh, that climb a little bit, really hit that climb hard, you could see this cause another separation from the pack. Because I have a feeling there's going to be riders in that pack that are going to look to try and jump across like Freddie Ovette is doing right now. 10 watts per kilogram coming from Ovette go. going across now as well before they even hit the climb. Matt, making things difficult right before a crucial section that makes it difficult for everybody makes it so you can't sit in quite as much. So this is going to make it hard on everyone. There's going to be no rest before this climb. There's Everyone's heart rates are going to be raised, and this is going to make it more difficult for those who might not have the breadth of fitness, the breadth of power to work with all the way through this climb. And those who do have that breadth, who do have that attritional race in mind, they're going to absolutely love this state of things. Oh, totally. And you see the Freddie Ovette's got across. You called it. He accelerated across a five-second gap. He's joined the front, but that has set alarm bells ringing because the gap to the bunch behind now has come down to just under two seconds. There is Freddie Ovette, 260 watts now kicked up to like six seven hundred watts when he got across that gap just shows the kind of form he's in and we know from freddie's a uh, big ambassador for swift isn't he we know from his social media who he's been out training with he's been out training with matthew van der Poel. so uh, we know the sort of endurance that freddie obert has got on board and we know that he'll like this longer race and i think you'll want to put behind him the relative disappointment about not qualifying for the final uh, in a, in glasgow last week uh, but today's course should suit him we know he's one of the fastest men at the finish, but I think he'd definitely prefer a longer race. But those little moves like that as well, um, it was interesting. He didn't just sit on the front and drag them back. He thought, OK, I'm going to jump across the gap and then leave everybody else to chase. So it's a smart move and also shows to me that Freddie's actually feeling very, very confident too. Still 41 Ks to go. So we've got around, I don't know, 50, 55 minutes of racing, if that. But we are now on uh, these lovely meandering roads here. You can just look at the, uh, the heavy, dense vegetation you can almost feel the humidity here can't you nathan yeah it does get a little misty here as we head into the jungle we'll be seeing some dirt here pretty quickly and this dirt does slow the riders slightly it's a little bit different from the sand uh or the gravel type um flat uh, you can tell the difference mainly is whether or not you see uh dust kicked up if there's dust that's being kicked up you do have the bikes slowed slightly that's going to make it so it's a little bit more difficult hang on i was gonna say uh this is gonna be the half tare uh stra bianca versus the full tare i think they were going for the full tare <laughs> most of the race now at this point we'll see if they can do the half tare but gotcha breakaway at this point i think they're all pretty motivated with the fact you can go with 80k no problem because we've seen it happen last week and yeah but uh we do have two trying to make a move off the front they're gonna be collecting their feather power up here in just a moment, as it's going to be Severa and Plantero, two riders that definitely can work together. Those are riders that got a really high threshold. Plantero loves a breakaway. We've seen him do it time and time again with the likes of Tugles. Now another rider trying to go across that looks like that's going to be Neil Freyet now. Freyet, one of my picks, actually, when it comes to these punchier races. Be on the watch out for him as Severa now in camera, only at 156 beats per minute as he's off the front. He's looking good, isn't he? Severa joined 
by Plantero. Again, another opportunity for Jez to be on the edge of his seat as his rider moves up the foot. There's also a rider trying to get across the gap there. That's Neil Fryat kicking out eight watts a kilo as the American as he tries to bridge across to the gap. He's in no man's land at the moment, but six seconds have been opened up. And I do agree. We've got around 40 minutes of racing, give or take to go, maybe 45 minutes of racing. But the likes of Severa and Plantera, I believe, are the sorts of riders, if they opened up a big enough lead and there was a little bit of a tactical standoff behind, could go the distance. But they have been joined in deep by the American. A great bridge across by Neil Freyat to uh, Freya there to give three riders out in front. They've opened up a lead of about five seconds now. So an interesting one there as they hit, hit the gravel again. There is the face of Plantereux. Looks pretty relaxed as he sits on the wheel. And this is where the road starts to just kick up a little bit. But they've been joined again by, the, I think, the rest of the peloton who is strung out in their wake. Again, I think that was just too strong a move. So it's, it's I wouldn't say it's surprising me, but, but what we can see is that they, the peloton are very, very active in bringing these brakes back. No lead has gone out for more than 10 seconds. And that was earlier for the Prix. Yeah, I want to bring in Elise here real quickly because uh, Neil Freyette is somebody who got on our radar, actually, leading into U.S. National Championships. He took second overall at the U.S. National Championships. And Elise, we saw this from Freyette, actually, I believe it was in Innsbruck, on the Innsbruck climb. Later in the race, he made a lot of moves to stay involved and then did an attack up and over the top and won the race outright in an all-out sprint in a race of absolute attrition. And you were involved. You raced the entirety of the Echelon Racing League. That was a no-joke league, actually, that, uh, that that you had participated in. And, you know, a rider who can win in that kind of a race, Neil Freyette, coming onto our radar throughout that, I think he's definitely one to watch out for today, Elise. He is. He is one absolutely one to watch for. And his power, and he's just getting stronger and stronger every single race. Um, you know, this is, this is all just really good to see. I'm looking at Depo up, the, up off the front again, just slamming it right now. Uh, Zach Neer right behind him. Uh, yeah. What do you think, uh, Nathan, right here on the jungle? This is exactly what I predicted, you know, just body blow after body blow here. Um, just the guys just aren't having any chance to relax. Yeah, this is interesting that we do have this little bit of a downhill and then it does head uphill again. So it does change up this climb a little bit. You're super familiar with uh, this specific climb. I've seen you climb this actually in uh, quite a, a few a few races uh, and be yeah. on the attack through the, the, this, this climb until we hit this right-hand turn. This is not their most familiar way. So they're going to be thinking a little bit, I would think, about resting up here at this point and then taking it on to all the way to the top. And it's not just through the dirt, is it, Elise? That they're going to be climbing they actually have to come all the way up until they leave the jungle loop section and then head on over to that cutoff on the new coastal uh route so plenty of climbing yet here to go you said it was 8k but i think the hardest part's still in front of them isn't it exactly and that's an important uh thing to remember for everyone watching is you know this is probably the like the least ridden route on swift right now so not very many people are familiar with this area so it just keeps climbing. You climb all the way up to the bridge. It dips down to the bridge. You have that one little punchy climb, and then before you descend down into the coastal areas. So a lot of uh, um, a lot of riders here just aren't familiar with it and aren't familiar with the terrain to get the momentum going. So I'm actually I'm eager to see how some of these attacks are going to work, how the DSs are doing right now, uh, talking these athletes through it. So uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on this, Nathan? Well, one thing I was wondering about from your perspective uh, is this dirt versus the pavement and how hard it actually makes it for the riders to draft. Like how much harder is it through this section that both has a climb and is a little bit of dirt, right? So like in, if there was a comparison to real life for those who are coming in to watch Zwift maybe for the first time, you know, they're watching the classics a lot at this point. Uh, and as we go into the classics in real life, uh, you see a lot more splits in those races, and a lot of times it has to do with those dirt sections. It's take full advantage is taken of those, trying to make the race as hard as possible. Something kind of similar happens here from your perspective and your experience with racing. Does the dirt make that much of a difference, Elise? It might be mentally, but I swear it does. I, I just like, it's just hard to like get on the wheels 
or just to stay in the draft, you just feel so slow. So, and it feels like it just takes a little bit longer to get through your, your momentum is slower, um, which might be a great point, uh, a talking point for some of these guys when the momentum is down, um, you know, it's pretty good to see someone go off the front, which you can kind of see right now. Yeah, and then speaking of momentum, as they take from the dirt to the pavement, also a moment where the speed differentiations might be so different from those who are on the dirt still to when you actually hit that pavement. A great section maybe perhaps to kick the speed up a little bit as those might not be responding as fast. So uh, I think that's that section coming up here. We may see some riders try and push the pace as soon as it starts speeding up again. Well, thanks a lot, Elise. Awesome to hear your perspective uh, uh, being such a great uh, racer and uh, taking on these sections, of course, before. Matt, uh, you know, classics, we're in that time of year. They're on the dirt. Definitely sections in real life as well as in Zwift where you can kind of press the pace because the bikes travel just a little bit slower. Yeah, it's, it's pretty hard. Just a quick one before. You can just see on the left-hand side of your screen there, ride on cutoff. Two and a half minutes, guys. Please do get involved. I know you have already, as we see at Bjorn Andreasen, just uh, moving through to the front, our world champion, Michael Kaminsky, there as well. So you've got two and a half minutes to open up your companion app and uh, choose your favorite riders to give a ride on to or give everybody a ride on if you want to, if you're feeling particularly generous. We've got some big, big numbers trying to spot if anybody's got into tri triple digits. They have Freddie Ovette, 157, if my eyesight is correct. So he's looking good at the moment. But meanwhile, it is the man in the golden jersey, who's opened up a couple of seconds lead. This is a bold, audacious move by Michael Kaminsky of Poland. There he is. Great sort of bottom-up shot of our man who won on the streets of Glasgow, took 7,000 bucks and that golden Z1 bike as well. So, Kaminsky, clear. Is this a little bit of a surprise? Bit of a, a flex, I think. I think it's fair to say there, Nathan. Didn't I think Kaminsky would go so early? This is the rope bridge. Watch out. You might spot Indiana Jones uh, fighting... A, uh, a few nasty bandits on this one. This is quite hard. It really does kick up an opportunity to maybe snap the elastic here. Yeah, and i got to say, there's been a lot of riders that uh, have been able to hang on up until this point. To give you an idea of how hard it's been, it has split the group a little bit. Riders falling off the back. I see about three or four riders now unable to hang on to this pace. What's interesting is that Tugels immediately respond there. I do think it was a flex, though, from Kaminsky. I think the pace was not quite as hard as he had wanted it to be. Because he just went to the front at like six watts per kilogram. He didn't really attack, but then just settled in, in quotes, at 5.5. Yeah. It was, and, and just kind of rode there, com in quotes, comfortably. And then some came across him to go, well, we're not going to let that sneak across, but, you know, or, or, or get away from us. But it wasn't like a full on attack or anything. So I think it was definitely like, hey, are we racing here, guys, or not? Like, let, th this isn't our pace. We got something more than this. <laughs> and then we did get a response from the pack. Yeah, it was like boxers at a press conference, wasn't it? Sort of squaring up against each other, looking each other in the eye before their bouncers step in and separate them for fighting. Great move. That was, I think, a lovely flex there from the man in the golden jersey. Or perhaps he just wanted to show off his uh, golden jersey to everybody at home watching because it is pretty special. That's for sure. A cheeky little screen grab of him with no riders around him as James Barnes always dons that little sun cap, just James Barnes of South Africa. There he is. A lovely day wherever he is in the world. Imagine it, it is in South Africa. There he is looking good, just drifting through to the front. But that just says to, says to me that Kaminsky is feeling very, very good. You don't do that if you're feeling bad. You'll be trying to save energy. So he's clearly feeling really good. And definitely, Nathan, we don't often talk about the psychological plays that go on. It goes on in all levels of elite sport. And we saw that there. That was just a gentle reminder. I'm leading this. I can drift off the front and just come back for no real reason apart from the fact I'm in really good form. And that's going to make other riders maybe doubt themselves, think, oh, God, I, w w do I, should I really attack because he can do what he wants? I think it's a lovely play and a real insight to how well he's going and um, to how strong psychologically he is. I think there's a really interesting play as Barnes continues uh, to lead here. Yeah, this is not expected from my... I was not expecting this, but this is exactly what I was talking about this i wasn't expecting barnes to do it that, to be honest i was nope. not expecting barnes to be the one because he is the highest placed rider on next presented by in short i would think that we riding for him specifically but perrin is also there so it looks like the two bigger names from that team have made their way to the front now Virel 
Bjorn Anderson. We are seeing some of the huge, some of these really serious names make their way to the front the moment that it went to the pavement. As soon as it came off the dirt, they pressed the pace up in the six seven watts per kilogram, made sure that it was hard as possible, as well as positioned correctly, so that they do not find themselves at that back because there can be a little bit of a whiplash when that takes place. So. Now it looks like Devout the near here now on front with Abus Lacole now driving the pace seven watts per kilogram, two seconds here coming from Ed Laverick though. This is uh, interesting to see here from Ed. You know, this is a rider, be on the watch out for him if he can get himself into a breakaway situation or perhaps somebody who can take that Titans K1. But he is somebody who absolutely just wants a long, steady, all day climb. A rider like that, though, if he gets himself into a breakaway situation and is able to make the racing really hard with attack after attack, can make it attritional enough to try and get a solid win. As this gets closer and closer to an all-out punch without a break, though, Ed's probably thinking, I got to make something happen. Where can I go? Yeah, the thing that worries me a little bit, he gave us a little wave there from Ed Laverick, but uh, uh, I wonder, it, he's not going to be able to answer us, but he has used his only feather power-up. And that, to me... Is, would be a little bit of a worry. I'd be wanting to save that later on. But of course, if you want a little bit of a rest, why not use it? So riders are going to use them um, as and when they want to. Only two power-ups uh, for the whole of the 81 and a half kilometers. We've already had the draft power-up done, and that is Ed Laverick's only final power-up. But he's still there. But you saw the numbers. It was 350, 400 watts just staying in this little group. We're just coming towards the top of this climb now. Um, quite often, this is the route to come out to the Alpes as Swift in the other direction. So we now lose a lot of elevation. This is one of the ways, the longest descent on the whole of this course. So I had a good opportunity to sit in the wheels and get a little bit of a micro re recovery, get into that super tuck as well. So a real opportunity, I think, now we're at the top of this one to rest up because next up on the menu, Nathan, it is Titan's Grove from the other direction with that $1,000 preem at the top. Yeah, and I think there may be some speed leading into there as well. I am hearing that Ed Laverick yeah. has won the Ride On competition. Good on him. Whoa, He'll nice. be wearing that, that. blue Ride On jersey, uh, 205. So we'll be wearing that in our next race. Uh, as uh, today it is Teppo that's going to beat it, but he just, it's, uh, uh, 275? Did you say 275? That crazy amount of Ride Ons. Awesome to hear. Now, as uh, we are going to take on this new section, this may be somewhere that riders that maybe haven't been on Swift in a little while may not recognize. This is a little cutoff where you don't have to go all the way to the top of the, the uh, mountain climb reverse where you can actually take this little cutoff and head downhill on that giant bridge we have off in the distance. Now, Matt, this section coming up here. It's an extreme downhill. Actually, we get into some pretty high gradients downhill. And there's this little joke going around that downhills are the new uphills in Zwift in some ways. And we may see some riders that uh, like gravity a little bit more. Try and make some moves here in just a moment. Maybe. Because this section, of course, isn't necessarily easy as we do see a couple on the front. Yeah, we just saw a fell tree. Uh, on, on the right-hand side, just lovely detailing game here. Sorry, I'm such a geek. I do love looking at the, the detail in Watopia. I really do, but you're quite right. Um, riders are increasingly using the descents as a method to, to go clear because you can put a lot of power down because if you got into the super tuck, uh, although none of the riders here will have the, the draft power up left or the aero power up, if you use momentum right and just hit the power at the right time, you can open up a little bit of a lead, especially as we lead into Titans Grove because off the bottom of this descent, there's not actually that much flat before we head into that first kicker that, that leads us into Titans Grove. So it's a very fast section. We've seen how, how much the, the peloton has, uh, has thinned out. And just a bit of a stat check for you. We now have 67. So it was down to 60, but a few riders just got back on. So still 67 riders in this front group. It has thinned out a bit, but you're quite right. I think there's definite opportunities on the downhill uh, to try and do something a little bit different. Um, if not to break away, and nobody's going to attack on this downhill to try and win alone, but it could be to try and force a split, or at the very least, use that added momentum you've got to put yourself in a good position should it start to kick off on the Titans Grove, which invariably it will, as we see Turgles now moving through to the front. Yeah, and this is a really good point that you made just now, Matt, is that they're not most likely on a downhill. You're not going to try and break away solo, but it's really about the momentum that you can carry over the top of each other over and over again 
with little punches to try and build more speed than the pack behind you is necessarily carrying. There were some changes to the pack dynamics about a, a year ago or so, or a little less than a year ago, and what happened was that the riders at the front of a pack now have to work instead of just get this crazy roll through speed that then created this momentum of a snowball effect. Now at this point, if riders in a group are willing to work on a downhill, they can increase the speed exponentially over and over and over again with little kicks over and over again. And if there is a pack of riders off the front from a pack that's not very motivated on a downhill, you can definitely gain a lot more speed than they are producing and get away on those. And that is why downhills in some ways are the new uphills but you got to have riders come with you most of the time doing it solo can be a very difficult effort and really ends up being similar to being on a flat working against a pack that's doing the same watts per kilogram as you but with a few riders definitely can make something happen matt yep definitely with tepo lorio the man in the blue jersey won't be wearing next uh, next week but he's had uh, he's been very aggressive so far as we look at the man in the rainbow bands bjorn andreasen what can he do today very interesting. Here's this little section that you're talking about across the bridge. There we go. 300 meters of elevation. That road directly in the other direction is where you'll go up the Alp de Zwift. But as you say, this is that uh, big suspension bridge. And there we go. Super tuck there for Bjorn Andresen. Let's bring in Elise again. Elise, we're heading into the final now. 28.3 kilometers to go. This is the last real opportunity to take a breath, isn't it? Make sure you've got your fueling strategy right because when we hit Titans Grove, I'm expecting some action um, because I think there's an opportunity there to make a selection, but also we've got a thousand bucks up for grabs, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny you say take a breath. I think this is like maybe the second or third time we've seen their watts go at, you know, three watts per kg minimum. Uh, so, yeah, this is, I'm sure they're fully embracing this downhill uh, bypass section right now. But, you know, absolutely. I, I think we're going to see, honestly, any minute now, someone just breaking off the front just like Cabo did earlier. Uh, who's going to go with him? That's going to be the biggest question. So, Nathan, who do you think who's going to go for the prime? Well, what's interesting, what we just saw, and I think because the world champion ch champion kit is on Bjorn, we don't always recognize he's a WLC rider. And Teppo Lorio is also in the ride-on jersey, but he is also a WLC rider. Both of your teammates, I don't know if yes. you want to tip anything <laughs> off too much, but both of them were just on the attack going into the downhill, interesting enough, and Bjorn's on it again. And Teppo is following him, and Teppo is third overall. I'm reading a little bit of a tactic in here, perhaps, because they probably want to set him up as best as they possibly can for something out there today, being currently third overall in the series. Well, now that you just blew it, no, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know their plan, but absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't put it past it. We all know Wahoo Wukul has some of the greatest tactics out there. Who knows what they're planning? But why not? Why not help your teammate is what I said earlier. You know, next... Wahoo Nicole, and you have someone with the likes of Bjorn um, helping you. I mean, yeah, Teppo, he, he's going to, this is perfect. Just stay right there, stay in place, position correctly, save your energy while Bjorn helps you out. This is perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and we're heading into this uh, climb here in just a moment. We saw a lot of attacks go. Elise, I have a feeling we're going to see somebody try and make a longer move for this yet again, and uh, we'll probably get a lot of responses. This is going to be the real, I think, haymaker, or like one of the final blows coming into the finale, the, the last, well, we still have over 25K or so here to go, but with this $1,000 on the line here in just a moment, makes these last three climbs extremely difficult, Elise. Yeah, you know, it's going to be interesting. As soon as they get up off the climb, are they going to let go? Will they regroup? Will they keep going? Will they keep pushing the pace? So that's what I'm eager to see today. Uh, if they form groups right there at the top and keep pushing over to get that momentum down. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's like through the S's. It's just going to be, it's going to be great. Here we go. We see two more people going off the front. Uh, I'll let you handle that, Nathan. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Elise. Appreciate the, uh, the the inside look a little bit to Wahoo Lacole there, as well as ideas that may be playing out <laughs> to, in tomorrow's race. But uh, Matt, things are starting to kick off here. We got Eric Levelson, Michael Planthro now off the front, immediately gaining five seconds. 
and I think that was perfectly timed. These are two riders that really know their Zwiftcraft because the way they attacked there made it so that they carried a ton of speed from a flat into an uphill gradient, which then exasperated how much time they were able to get from the pack who was not traveling nearly as fast into an uphill gradient. Yeah, it was just really smart. You, you talk about, and, and this is where not just craft on the bike, not just physical ability and strength, it's, um, it's knowing the route, knowing what's coming next as well, and, and having done your recons. As you said, there's quite a few bits of this course that are massively familiar, but it's been sewn together in a very different way to give it this unique big loop. So it's all about doing your homework. It's all about knowing when to lay the power on it. And they did open up a second, uh, a, sorry, a seven second lead to Plantera is here with Levinson. Levinson rolls through to the front, but the gap is coming down now. There's a lot at stake. Remember, $1,000, but Levinson out of the saddle. This is this hard section here. If you can try and stay seated, is everybody's got a different sort of technique on Zwift, but this is where it continues to roll up and down. And then it does drag on for the last bit. But we've got Kaminsky, the man in the golden jersey, the leader of the Zwift game so far after one round, is dragging them back here. Kaminsky is on a right right. He's already attacked off the front just for show. And he's showing his strength here because the, uh, the little breakaway of Levinson and Plantera is about to be brought back to heel. Still 3.7 kilometers to the stop or to the top of this pre Nathan. Yeah, and you look at the way that the pack is spread out at this point. This is a lot of times there's just nothing you can do about it. This this isn't people sitting in and going, okay, I'm going to rest. I'm going to sit in. I'm going to oh, wait. No. This is, can you hold on or can you not? The moment a little bit of a gap opens up between that long, strung out line, that's the moment that you have to either have it to come across or it is lights out, game over. And the lights are going out behind a whole lot over and over again, it looks like, as this is a real split. As we saw the race leader, Kaminsky, going across, we saw the likes of second over all, the dark male also starting to get involved there. To have Mikel Plantero as well as Leonard Tugels, who have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe in Zwift Grand Prix over and over again, closing that down and making sure that Plantero does not get all the way with Levinson tells you exactly how many alarm bells were going off. It's all back together, but Dave, I mean, excuse me, Matt, the, uh, the, uh, the reality here of this situation is that it has caused a lot of damage behind. Yeah, it has. The bunch has thinned, thinned out. We've, we've lost about 10 or 15 riders off the back, actually. Um, about 12 riders, in fact because of that initial acceleration, because of the surge bringing it back together. It wasn't so much the riders off the front, it was the reaction of the peloton led by the man in the golden jersey. He wanted to bring things back together. I'm almost thinking now, does he want it all? Does he want to have his cake and eat it? I mean, why bring that back? A really interesting deployment of energy, really. We know that uh, the Polish rider is in great, great form, but this deep into the race, doing little bits like that, you've got to question why he did that why did he sit on the front unless he's feeling almost indestructible but we we talk about it often in real life racing when you're in a leader's jersey it gives you a couple more percentage points he's clearly feeling on top of the world as is this man planterer is going again another big acceleration by the frenchman to go clear cunningham also there yeah it looks like this is going to be over and over again the reality of how they want to roll the dice here. Cunningham, Brzezinski, Levinson, they do not want an all-out sprint to the top of this. They want to try and make this as difficult as possible because the reality is, is Michael, uh, Michael Plantero does not have a good kick, but he does have this all-day power. And he, I think, is going to take every opportunity. What's going to happen here until it's just not possible any longer to maybe get away is Plantero is going to attack over the top weight, attack over the top weight. I think he's just going to continue to try and break this apart. And I think he is going for this thousand at the top, maybe create a launch pad, but I don't think that Plantero is maybe not necessarily as interested in the finish line. Of course, if it comes down to it, he's going to be there for it. But I think he's trying to put some chips on the table here for this specific sprint. It's almost like a little, a bit of a mini insurance policy. If you're not super confident and you're not, and you didn't score too many points uh, in the previous weeks, you've got to look at what you can get from these, from this with games and and the addition of these super premiums, for want of a better word, does make riders think differently. And that little play at the bottom of the climb, that second attack with 1,500 meters to go, suggested that Plantra is all in for this preem um, and then just see what happens a little bit later on. But look at this flat front to the to the bunch here. 
the first time we've seen that, things getting a little bit tactical. And all this is going to do is to fall into the hands of anybody wanting to try and go long or leave it to a sprint. But uh, we've just seen an attack by Neil Fryat has just moved off front. So Jacob Jacobs, it is, is now moving off the front. So an interesting little move here. Still 1,100 metres to go. But Jacobs has opened up a nice little lead here. Let's have a look at the stats that it requires to hold off the front of the bunch. There you go. A whopping 536 watts. Can he sustain this for the next minute and a half? Jacobs here now out of the Netherlands. Freya now coming across. Serious jumps now happening to Coxner as well. Levinson, a name that we haven't seen hardly at all. Zach Near suddenly to the front as well. We saw him in Cameron just a moment ago. He looked extremely comfortable. Honestly, I think he's been saving a lot. Another name that we haven't seen at all, who's one of the best Zwift craft in the world current U.S. national champion, Brian Duffy Jr. didn't make it into the final in Glasgow, trying to follow his arch nemesis of the USA, who took second at the U.S. nationals, which is Neil, Neil Freyat here. The two Americans starting to make their way to the front here, but being followed very closely by the current world champion, Bjorn Anderson, there as well. Vidar Mail, second overall in the standings right now, sitting in as well. Now we're getting right into it here. 300 meters to the line. The gallop is starting here. It's going to be Legrafin, Paradines. Paradines now to the front. The Feather Power is being used and it's all in if you're using the feather pile up at this point this one's coming right to the line Vidar Mail Vidar Mail 13 watts per kilogram he wants that thousand bucks can he take down Paradis is it going to be Mail is it going to be Paradis Paradis holding holding to the line Paradis gets it it looks like to me I think it was Jasper Paradis the Belgian takes down a thousand bucks now the question is will it be a launch pad well, that's a great little move there by Paradigms. Vidal Mel was also there. Uh, Yetnez also in the mix. So some of the runners you'd be expecting to be there up at the end, happy to put a few chips on the table, as you said, and go for it. Why not try? Riders who are feeling confident uh, certainly had a go. There was all the big hitters there, even the world champion up in the mix there. Let's have a look at what that's done to the bunch. It's thinned it out ever so slightly. We've got about 58 riders. Now, this is an opportunity for riders. They've got now the draft power-up. Now, could somebody use that to slingshot? Because look at the damage that has been done by that acceleration. So many riders wanted that thousand bucks, but only one rider could have it. Just under 20 Ks to go. And there we go. It's a Nicolo Severa on the front now, but it is all still together. I tell you what, let's, uh, let's bring in Elise just uh, for another occasion because, Elise, what are your thoughts on that one? Some of the big hitters <laughs> with overall aspirations getting involved for the money. Money talks, doesn't it? Yeah, but it could also be a preview of what's to come here at the very end, yeah. you know, the final sprint finish. So, I mean, if that doesn't excite everyone, I don't know what else does because it's it's brought back here. Uh, Nathan, can you see how many are in that group right here? Yeah, it looks like about 36, 37, 38 have about made it right around there. It's right around that 36-ish marker. So, that, I mean, that split the group completely. I mean, about... I'd say 40 riders have gone out the back and are trying to get together to try and cause some sort of a chase. It may come back because the riders at the front might not want to make it too difficult because a lot of riders may have made it at this point, right? That's always the big question, isn't it, Elise? You look around and you start thinking, who's made it? Do we want to make any risks at this point? That's exactly what I was going to say. The, the first thing that I would notice as soon as I come over and I'm coming down and I'm in that final group, how many people are in that group with me and what teammates do I have, you know, or what teammates do the other people have? So if I know that Coalition Alpha here has certain, you know, certain like three or four people, Hexagon has, you know, only has one other. Okay. Uh, but here you have next has five five guys in there so all these things i'd be asking my ds uh just to know and be aware of yeah 100 percent. there's definitely going to be taking count and how quickly you can take count is also a big factor isn't it at least whether or not you have that support, like you were saying, whether or not you have that DS able to quickly go who's here i know exactly what's happening getting the most correct information Definitely is whether or not you can even play the chessboard correctly, isn't it, Elise? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, sometimes a lot of us have more than one DS at a time. So if you have someone else just on to do that data search for you, that makes a massive help. I mean, that way the other person can just focus on helping those in that front pack. So here we see, I'm not surprised at all. He's going off the front two goals. Uh, but 
not that much of a break and maybe just trying to string out the pack and tire people out a little bit more. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's really interesting what you said there uh, just a moment ago, Elise, that sometimes you've got people with more than one job because there's so much going on, right? You've got the racers. Their job is to pedal, go hard, make sure that they do their, their, their job correctly. And then you've got someone who's making the calls in the moment. And then it sounds like you even have this like strategy or someone who can at least bring in the data and maybe a little strategy to that data to be like, hey, here's what's happening. Have a conversation and then uh, let the the individual who's giving the direct calls actually make those calls. That sounds so much like what I see in real life sometimes as well, where you have multiple <laughs> in a team car trying to make those calls and look over the data. And it's so really cool to hear. Um, and something that sounds like from you that you really rely on in this. I mean, just real quickly, at least you're, you've come into this whole space in, in the last year or so. It's been a, probably a pretty big learning curve, but you've also hit the front end of this stuff and, and take on that learning pretty quickly. You've leveled up. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's been a lot. It's been a lot of studying. I love geeking out on this stuff. But yeah, a lot of watching these people. Thank goodness a lot of these guys uh, put their stuff on YouTube. So learning their Zwiftcraft, watching them, having people, honestly, like, don't get dropped, Eric Lee, just like helping me out all the time uh, with little things here and there. It's been fantastic. So I, it's, it's literally taken a whole village, honestly. So shout out to the level team guys, Cy Bradley's team, and um, just everyone out there here and there, girls too, who've just reached out to help. Absolutely awesome. Well, the action's kicking off. We got three making moves. At least thank you so much for your insights there. Now, Near, though, we were talking about this, Matt, just a moment ago. Zach Near, Eric Levinson, Michael Planthro, all making moves. And Zach Near, this is his first real go, but this is a guy who loves 1K to go breakaways, 3K to go. He's kind of that end of the race uh, dark horse that can pull off a winning move if he gets it just right. Zach Near, be on the watch out for him. Uh, as I think he's got three seconds, and he is definitely a workhorse that can make things happen. Yeah, we're at the stage of the race. I, I totally agree. It's a rider just trying to get across the gap. It's Mathieu de Kock of Belgium trying to get across, sensing this is a dangerous move. His teammate at the front of the bunch as well, Yasta Paradigms, maybe trying to block, uh, block a little bit. But with 15 k's to go, um, and look at the clock. So with... We've been racing now for an hour and 25 minutes. And, and, and by eSports terms, this is a long day in the saddle already. We've still got 15 k's to go, just under 10 miles of racing, including two ascents of the, uh, of the Zwift King of the Mountains in the opposite direction. And then finally, that climb to the line. And then, of course, we've got the S's as well. There's loads of little opportunities to, to chip away on this finishing circuit. But I tell you what, I've been very impressed with the man that's on the front now, uh, Michael Plantreau. We can see picture in picture Levinson, but we saw Plantro. But he's, he's been off the front about on two or three occasions. But that just shows he is a rider that favours those multiple efforts, the longer race. Just he's got that real deep endurance, and that's I'm sure, I'm sure why Jez picked him for his favourites because he really is riding strongly here, not afraid to go clear or at least try something. But the gap hasn't opened up. It went up to six seconds back down to three and a half there's still a lot of momentum behind as we hit this finishing circuit now 14.7 k's to go this has been a brilliant race so far and still nathan so so difficult to call and the front group has actually swelled now a few riders have got back on we've now got 47 riders in the lead group save for these three that are just off the front by two and a half seconds real quickly i want to notice that next they're starting to send riders and they've got what I think is to one, two, maybe four, even five in the pack out of 35 riders or so. That's a lot of numbers. And now That's you can start sitting and sending riders. Avis Lacole, though, they've got numbers as well, too. So now we start getting that numbers game, don't we, Matt, where you can start sending riders and start getting happy with something that's up the road, letting it go, and these other riders become vulnerable. I'm looking at Vidar Mail, who's second overall right now, becomes vulnerable without too many Movistar riders and starts having to take the race underneath his own hands here. Now, he is a rider who can make it happen. I mean, he he broke away and and, and, and won the race, actually, in the first sprint race, right? So this is a rider who, who almost maybe likes that situation, but he's going across now to, as Johan Norin, though, looks to get involved here. And this was another pick I said on the podcast to watch out for. Somebody who might be going under the radar, 
This guy can break away, and he can stick this all the way to the line if he's really got a good day. And Nicky Hug knows exactly that as he looks to try and go across from next as well. Yeah, Nicky Hug, uh, the second and a half, is going the opposite way through the traditional finish on this, uh, this classic circuit. It really is a wonderful circuit. Thousands upon thousands of people on it every single day. Hug goes straight past the man from Sweden. They've got a, a few seconds in. Is Levinson, Freddie Ovet also opening up the taps. This is a really difficult bit of road. Top right of your screen there, you can see the gradient there, 3%. It's really grippy. This will in turn take us into the S's. It's up and down. And then it won't be long before we approach the climb in the reverse direction. It's a long climb. It's two and a half kilometers. But the section right at the bottom is where I think it will split because the last bit of drag, the last K and a half, you can actually get quite a lot of benefit by sitting in the wheels. But the riders off the front now aren't waiting until that point because they've opened up a two, three seconds lead. Oh, Vett has got across the front. Levinson is there. Nicky Hug, this is a very good group of riders here. Just under 13 Ks to go. This is cooking up to be a real treat here. Oh, it is. And now this is because they've seen the group not have that swell any longer. They don't have the numbers in the group any longer. They're going to have a lot more confidence to try and break this apart. I am hearing... Matt, that this race has been so incredibly difficult. One of the biggest sprinters in the world of esports, Holden Kamu, is out of the race from a snap crank. He had snapped his wow. crank off his bike. I'm sorry to hear that, Holden. But, man, to give you an idea of the kind of pressure that they put on their equipment and the power that's being produced here, over the top of that K1 for that thousand bucks is where it happened. Crazy to see. Now it's going to be Hug over the top. Verhel's here as well. It's going to be Levinson. Johan Norn. Three seconds still. It's not back yet. And Matt, they're starting to back off a little bit on the front end of the main pack. Now, Don can see that from Hexagon. As Hexagon, are Hexagon actually involved up here? I don't think they are. And because of that, I think they're going to try and send one across. Yeah, this, this is a very good little move. Nicky Hug now driving hard on the front. We know well, Nicky Hug is one of those riders that has really kept his, pr his powder dry, to, to use a commentator's cliche, on a race of this distance. Remember, total distance of this epic championship today, 81.5 Ks, a very long day out in the virtual saddle today. And Nicky Hug has kept his powder dry. He's conserved that energy and has now surged clear with this uh, elite group of runners. Johan Andrean is there. Eric Levinson and Freddy Ovet still trying to get across the gap as the Belgian run is for hell. And then it's a further four or five seconds back to the peloton. They haven't given up yet, that is for sure. But I tell you what, this is a very strong group of riders. A quick super tuck there for Nicky Hug, giving him an opportunity to gulp in some air, in some air before he's back on the power again. Again, that just shows the craft of these riders over the bridge. And then they'll start that long winding section to go up the back as the back side of the uh, the the, uh, the king of the mountains the uh, the climb here in watopia and it's a hard one to get right isn't it? it's very different than the traditional route up isn't it nathan just describe what it's like to to people out there just uh, people are used to the the, the normal way around but the, the coming up the reverse of the kom is is hard to get right sometimes yeah, it is. Uh, it's got a pretty good kick up front. It does get into the double digits and then it flattens out for a moment. And it's just kind of this undulating climb where there's a lot of good draft on it, but it's definitely uphill almost the entirety of the way. But it's not extremely steep except for just up front. So you can do an initial kick, get the speed up over the top of that, the, over the top of that initial kick, and uh, that goes along those uh, cyclist statues. And then from there, you end up into this kind of rolling, undulating climb all the way to the top. Uh, when I'm doing all out VO2 max efforts, about a four minute climb, I think these guys are going to do it at three and a half or maybe even less than that. They do have seven seconds now at this point. This is dangerous, oh, yeah. in my opinion. The big question uh, to me, because there's such big names behind here at this point, has the racing really been that hard that the likes of Harris, the likes of Tugels, the likes of Duffy Jr., Zach Neer. Uh, we're also talking about, obviously, James Barnes, Tepo Lorio. There's some really big names behind here that I think are mainly kind of uh, look at their chops thinking, look, I'm pretty sure we're going to bring something back, but we're going to use this to completely split this group apart. 
in just a moment, I think we're going to see insane fireworks from the pack behind to go across to this. But Hug says, forget it. And I did see Nikki Hug just a moment ago put his hands in the air in his, in his pain cave there. Like, what the heck? I think he was kind of frustrated with the lack of work because Norin was kind of attacking off the front a little bit. And it wasn't consistent. So I think Hug just said, forget this. I'm just going to go for it. Yep, he's a rider we know. He's won at the highest level in esports. He's, he's won rounds of his Rift Grand Prix in the past. There he is. He's just got that lid. It's starting to come back now. Freddie Ovet, the Australian, trying to bring him back now. And there is the gap. So there's, a, there's pockets of riders. You can just sell tell how the pressure is on here because riders aren't able to stick together too much. Riders are surging through in the shadow of the volcano over the bridge and this is where the road will start to kick up in just a few moments time. It's gradual at the start then it really does ramp up. I think it does hit double digits as Hug now sees his lead diminish somewhat. One and a half seconds now to Noren. Also Ovet there two seconds behind then there's these couple of riders in between uh, in between including ricardo pinetza and a planter and then a further five seconds back so things are really starting to split up here and there's only about 36 37 riders left in the main peloton 9.2 k's to go hug from switzerland is clear this is brilliant stuff let's bring in before it really does start to kick off elise again elise it's been a riveting race. My, my throat is hoarse. I'm on the edge of my seat here, but what a ride here by Nicky Hug. <laughs> Clearly wasn't happy with the way that group was riding. And as Nathan said, they said, right, I'm going to go on my own. Right. And then I'm sitting here watching the chase pack. Some of them aren't even working together. So it's, it's actually quite interesting. Some of them, I mean, there's all these, as you can see at the bottom of your screen, mini chase packs just trying to bring Hug back. And so, yeah, right here, we're going to see even more of that break. Are they going to bring back? It's up to 15 seconds now. So this is so interesting. I'm loving it. Nathan, what do you think? I don't know. I just, I, I'm wondering if this is a setup from next to send a rider up, make it really difficult, and then jump across with some firepower. Or are they just saying... Every man for himself at this point, if Nikki can win it outright, great, grow down him and make that happen. But I think next are watching Tugels. I think next are watching some of these others behind. Freddie Ovet now looking to go across, makes that juncture here to them. Tugels, though, behind this pack is now starting to ramp things up. And I think there's a few riders still in that main group that are waiting for their moment to pounce and not be taken full advantage of. And I think that a lot of this time is going to come back. And now we're going to see the real separation happening from the main peloton as they make a catch here, perhaps. They're going to have to work extremely hard because we've got the lights of the current overall leader as well, Kaminsky, on the attack behind. And they've already brought that back to five seconds. So I think that this is a setup. Yeah. And maybe, at least, some of those other riders up front maybe took the bait from a setup from some of these other teams. Yeah, very smart and not at all surprised from next. Um, very tactical, like I said before. Um, you see the likes of Zach Near coming back uh, to the pack right now. Uh, or here in a little bit, he's only wasted about five, 4.5 uh, watts per kg, whereas the other ones up at the front were doing how much, you know, eight or nine, I mean, just constantly burning matches, like I said. So yeah, it's in, and look, the, the pack is almost all back. We have four second gap, but it is strung out. If you get an aerial view uh, for everyone to see, it's, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens completely strung out and as you said the team tactics are absolutely playing out here i'm seeing and, and there's a reality isn't there at least real quickly that you've got names that are marked and sometimes marking those names once in a while fails but you kind of put a risk on it like a percentage risk in your head like most of the time and then you you put a couple of riders together like two goals duffy jr i mean on your side of things there's probably specific women that you'll mark and say if these three aren't doing anything how we can give them a certain amount of time will probably and you, you kind of play that risk reward percentage game a little bit uh when you roll the dice or, or uh, on this how you make your bets on when you put your efforts out there and that's why i was saying huh there's enough big hitters still in here that they're probably hedging their bets still at least they are but you know what those legs are getting tired they, they have not stopped they've been on the power continuously now for what an hour and 40 minutes so, uh, yeah, we're getting close to the end here. They're having to save. They know it's going to be a bunch sprint finish up the climb at that. Uh, so, I mean, they're tired. They're exhausted. Cramping could be possible as well. So, 
at some point you just have to say i'm doing as best i can and i'm trying to counter these attacks but um bjorn andresen doing it again up at the front you have zach near it right there uh james barnes right below it so i don't know we'll, we're gonna see what happens yeah, they just did a 3.29. I'm seeing a 3.29 as the fast time up and over the top of this. So that is absolutely flying as Bjorn Anderson takes it over the top. Elise, thank you so much for your insights here as we get into the final 6K or so. Matt, I think that next are just sending riders off the front over and over and over again while they're also waiting in the pack with a few riders that they've got their, their their final go at it here you know they're playing a couple of aces up their sleeve a little bit here while they send riders again and again and there's a couple of riders out here that kind of have to do it for themselves i'm seeing bjorn anderson vidar mail Mikel plantero there's a few at freddie Ovet definitely just has to follow whatever goes and that's one thing where you don't have a team that kind of makes it difficult doesn't it matt when it's like you've got to cover everything where when you have a team, you can just trust your teammates to, to go up the road. Yeah, that there's, there's, there's the team aspect of it, but also we're in relatively unfamiliar territory in, in, the ter in, in terms of how long we've been racing for. An hour and 40 minutes, probably going to wrap this up in about another 10, but sort of eight or 10 minutes time. So it's going to be just under two hours of racing. So, but you said next have got a lot of riders up there. Um, they seem to be communicating well, but also I think... What what's quite telling is the fact this isn't although there will be team a team play this isn't a team event the Zwift Grand Prix was a team event uh, this isn't this is all about the individual glory and this will actually give us a real insight into uh, the relationships of these riders with numbers up at the front do they trust each other will they be sharing the prize money all, all little issues like that because ultimately there, there can only be one winner there's only one no, ten thousand pounds for the overall ten thousand dollars for the overall remember as well as that wonderful gold wahoo kicker bike but under now 5k's to go just a big big thank you to the whole of the swift community anybody who's joined us on the stream today thank you so much wherever you are in the world for watching thank you for getting involved in the ride-ons thank you for your your comments Thank you for using the dash because we're in the closing stages now. This is the epic championships week two of the inaugural Zwift Games. It's been a spectacular race. We've only got about 40 riders left in the mix. And it is Johan Noren who is surging clear. Nathan, one more time up the, uh, the KOM. That's where the finish is going to be. Who is going to take the win here? Noren now opening up a nice little gap. Yeah, and this is an interesting section to go at because... He could be allowed some space through the SEs here. They may not ride quite as hard as him through the SEs. We'll see, though, but Tugel says enough is enough here. And that is one thing I definitely want to highlight here is that a lot of these riders are most likely trying to soften up the legs of the likes of Josh Harris and Leonard Tugels. Uh, Mikel Plantero, not so much, has been off the front a whole lot, but Tugels has just been closing down only what he needs to. Johan Noren, though, made a move here into the SEs. Not sure this is going to stick because they went just hard enough up on the top. Now, it is a race of meters, though. Is he going to back off? Does he have anything left in the tank? It does look like he's going to back right on off now. Yep. You can just see the watts, 312 watts. This is where it just drops down a little bit of an opportunity to recover, but he hasn't opened up maybe the lead that he wanted. As Nathan said, we're now into the S's. It's like uh, the road twists left and right. It actually can be quite disorientating in game. You get a little bit of a nauseating effect as the road continues to chop and change direction, ebbs and flows in terms of gradient as well. It's a very hard section to get the power right, but he's moving quickly. 46 k's of hour to, uh, an hour, 3.4 kilometers to go. The bunch of bearing down being led by the Belgian powerhouse. That is Leonard Turgles, a man that could win this one on his own. Two seconds lead the lead continuing to come down but this is a super super ride by Johan Noren of Sweden just going over the top now is Ricardo Pinazza the Italian now in the mix 3.2 k's to go a couple more of these little s's the drop down through to the finish then we're over the bridge and we're into the final climb three k's to go Nathan Three Ks to go, three Ks to go, and the attacks are starting left and right, but the pack hasn't let it get too far away from them. We may have the old school where it all kind of started in some ways. The Hilly KOM forward out on Zwift is going to be the finish for the Zwift Games epic race here in just a moment, and we've got a pack of what looked to be about 30 hungry riders trying to take this down. It's going to be Planthro making the early move to make this 
as hard as possible onto this downhill as they're going to come through that Piers Banner. Now backing off, Panizan out to the front here, all out to the top of the KOM in just a moment. Plenty of riders still involved, and I think it's kind of anyone's race still. This is amazing. It hasn't totally. split up, and now anyone can have this in a minute and a half climb out here, Matt. Well, we saw... We saw Jason Osborne, didn't we, a few years back, taking the first ever World Championships on Zwift up this very climb from a similar size group. And it looks like the inaugural Zwift Games Epic Championships is going to be done in a similar way. But not if Eric Levinson is going to do something different. 450 watts for the American as he opens up a two-second gap, moving quickly through the finishing line here. This isn't the finish, though. We've got 1,900 metres to go, a couple of turns over the bridge, and then that very steep section the, uh, the hilly KOM is a, is a climb of two halves here, but this is a good move, a bold move by the American. Wants to try and get a little bit of a lead ahead of the climb. It's Nicky Hug, the, the Swiss rider who goes straight past him, Nathan. Yeah, and I just want to highlight real quickly, this is a Dan Jamrozik move, and Dan Jamrozik actually was doing that, the, kind of coming across here, but it's a move that goes immediately from the peers and trusts that the pack might not be that motivated to chase right now and trust that it'll come back. Jam Rosarick actually had made it during Zwift Grand Prix from the piers all the way to the top of the climb because of an early move like this. Didn't happen this time, it looks like. Is going to be brought back as Levinson gets brought back into the pack. But now, Tugels, Tugels and Hug off the front. That's not a name that you want to see having two seconds heading into the final climb. Tugels has seven watts per kilogram. This is a guy that could go not even from bottom to top, but he could go from almost a K out to the top. Well, Leonard Turgle says 500 watts. He's certainly got more in the tank. He'll lift it to six, 700 watts. He's opened up a couple of seconds gap. One kilometer to go now. This is the Epic Championships. This is the Swift Games. And this is Leonard Turgles. He saved the featherweight power up. He's had that in his back pocket. 850 meters to go. What a move here by the Belgian. This is the steepest part of the climb, Nathan. Double digits for the Belgian. He's got a three second lead. Three second lead, but Neil Friet, Neil Friet behind. Tugels has got eight watts per kilogram, but Neil Friet did 13 watts per kilogram at the bottom of the climb. Went in with massive speed, and Friet is coming across. He's got four seconds on the pack. They both have four seconds. It's going to be a two up. Can he come across to Tugels at this point? Sit in and come over the top. Does he have anything left? Is going to be the huge question because Tugels continues on. Tugels looks to break Neil Friet, but will Neil Friet, the American, be able to come through? He's got a feather power up still. Josh now coming across, trying to come across. It's going to be the German rider here ahead of the pack. The pack is no longer involved in this. It looks to me like Neil Friant. He's going to do it. Oh. 11 watts per kilogram and a feather power up over the top. It's got it. It's, it's Neil Ferret, the American, has gone straight past Lego Tugs. He's swept by him. The American absolutely flying. A perfect deployment of the featherweight power up. Nobody else can be seen. He rounds the corner. The road mercifully dips before rising again. The American is going to take it. He's going to take, well, this race. The epic championship has been won by Neil Flaherty of the, of the United States of America. What a super, super win there ahead of Leonard Turgles in second place. Brian Duffy Jr. in third place. But what a ride by Neil Flaherty there. A wonderful, wonderful acceleration. Perfect deployment of the featherweight power up. Your winner of the epic championships is Neil Flaherty. I tell you what, Nathan, what an amazing ride that was. Absolutely amazing. And I think it was Ali Jones. It's, I believe it may have been Duffy Jr. Ali Jones Ooh, perhaps sorry, across yeah, Jones, the line yeah. in, in third. No, no. I think Jones just slipped in there. Just slipped in there at the end. Absolutely amazing, though. Neil Fred, bottom to top. I didn't think it could be done. He did. I have <laughs> never seen 13 watts per kilogram across the bridge with speed into the climb. But really, it's about momentum. We've said it time. In time again, momentum is what wins. <sighs> Absolutely crazy to see. Well, let's head back on over to the studio for some post race analysis with Jez and Dan. Thank you, Nathan. Dan, what a race! <laughs> what a race! That um, was epic, wasn't it? Literally epic in in nature, but the, it, it almost as they were saying in the commentary, unprecedented in terms of the distance. And there was just that constant like grinding down of that quality group until we had. In the end, really, the best riders left. Yeah, it was absolutely relentless. So attritional from the start. It really did go from the gun. And with those two 
Ascents up Titans Grove, and of course, that really tough finale. finale. It was a really great race. Yeah, the uphill watch. finish was absolutely perfect. I tell you what, our top 10 is ready. Should we have a look at it? Here we Let's go. Let's do that. So in first place, Neil Fryer, what a finish. He saved that power up to perfection. And 13 watts per kilo, amazing. Second place, we have Leonard Tugels, really aggressive ride. And my man, Ollie Jones in third place, my overall pick in our studio <laughs> predictions, of course. Yep. Uh, Brian Juffy Jr. in fourth, Josh Harris in fifth, the Aussie, Tom Thrall in sixth, Johannes Keating, first of the Swedish powerhouses in seventh, Bart van den Eck out in eighth, Bjorn Andresen, the world champion, still there in ninth, and Freddy Avet sneaking into that top 10. Um, what an illustrious top 10 as well. A very fair race in the end, Danny, as well, where the, by the looks of it, the best riders have all made that leading group, but it's come down to the timing of that late attack as well. And I was surprised, I actually must admit, like you, I think, didn't think there were many riders that had their feather power-ups left, but First and second place riders both used them, and not just used them, but seemingly used them at exactly the right place. Yeah, and we heard from Josh Harris, didn't we, at the start about how important the technicalities of these races yeah. are. And it seemed to me that those were the riders that came out on top tonight, the riders that used those power-ups in exactly the right place. Of course had the legs, but rode a really smart race for what was such a long race, and it was relentless from yeah. start to finish. Notably as well, we so often talk about in Zwift racing, particularly at the elite level, saving yourself, waiting and getting the timing right. Neil Fryat was not a rider that was being mentioned very much by our commentary team there, and we didn't really mention him in our previews and build up either. Uh, Leonard Tugels, we'd been so active, we'd seen him attacking and chasing and what have you during the race. And in the end, you just wonder whether that might have caught up with them a little bit. It, again, it was a classic case, as we'd seen in the sprint races last weekend, in the men's races in particular, of perfect timing and waiting to deploy not just the power up, but that big, what did you say, 13 watts per kilo? Yeah, 13 that final watts sprint. per kilo is absolutely humongous, isn't it? It was just yep. perfect riding. So let's have a look at the top 11 onwards then from 11th place onwards. Oh, actually, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Let's have a look at the top three and the winners of those preems because the money was a big driving factor, wasn't <laughs> money it? Money talks, doesn't it? Like Matt Boy, said in commentary, talk. it really did. So preem one going to Sebastian Havo, the French rider, and what a battle it was with Paniza. And then that second preem to Jasper Paradines, which was so close, a bigger group coming into that second preem. But like I said, money really does talk. Yes, $7,000 won by Neil Friet uh, this evening. And Leonard Tugels gets 5K for his hard efforts. And your man, the Kiwi, Ollie Jones in third with $3,000. Uh, the money has definitely helped make them really battle for it this evening because the racing's been brilliant, but brutally attritional. There was a, an awful lot of attacking at the back. The back door of that peloton was open all the way throughout and quality riders just gradually as the distance went by just dripping out the back of it. Weren't yeah they? I loved having those preems actually because so many riders were of course going for you know such a big prize pot at the, at the top. It meant for really exciting racing and riders also of course going for that almost springboard effect off yeah. the top of those yeah. QOMs. Yeah. yeah I think the course really helped with that didn't it? It did. Should we have a look at the slightly more painful placings now as we see riders who just tailed off towards the finish, still finishing brilliantly and scoring really good points for the Wahoo overall, don't forget. Um, 11th place, Lennart Jaschk, the um, German rider, runners for Heller, the Belgians at near the next of the Americans in 13th place. Um, all the way down to Arne Jacobs there, the Dutchman in 20th, a couple of Brits in there too, in Perrin and uh, this is 21st to 30th. Uh, just look for a few names. James Barnes was one of our big picks for today, the South African. And your pick as well, unfortunately, down in 30th ah, place, Jez. You were was... bigging him up through the race, maybe too aggressive. Well, he was very aggressive. He was very evident. We saw him attack on a number of occasions when the road was in its sort of windy formation too. Horvald Yeldnes, another one of our big picks for the day as well, performed very well in the sprint races, inside the top 40 at least. Nicky Hug as well, I just picked out from that list, really aggressive at, towards the end of the race, attacking relentlessly in those final few kilometres. Yeah, so only just inside the top 40, despite the fact that he led into the last couple of K, he was solo, wasn't just he? shows so... how important the timing is yeah. and was. Yeah, absolutely. Ed Morgan there in 42nd place, again, another one of our picks as well. So once again, an illustration, if it was ever going to be a clear illustration in the Epic Championship, the, the, the measuring out 
of energy and effort over that whole time, absolutely crucial. It was. We will, of course, be following with the all-important Wahoo overall points, but first, let's speak to Nathan and Elise to get their thoughts on what we've just seen. Really good racing is what we just saw. That was absolutely awesome. My heart rate was through the roof. I don't know if I've been that excited for Swift Racing in quite a while. One of the craziest attacks. I mean, talk about going all in, both with Tugles and Freyette. I mean, sometimes you kind of race a little bit negatively. You kind of wait under control. They kind of just threw caution to the wind. Tugles all in. Neil Freyette, they both we're rewarded for it but talk about Freyette here Elise yeah not only that but like he like literally negative split that climb so he started off at like oh nine watts ten watts per kg and then as soon as he took that left hand turn hairpin turn I mean just blasted it up um, also interesting um, pointing out that I would say about what 90% of the guys saved their power up and used the feather so that's also good to note as well I was, I was just interested to see yeah. if people were going to save it. He was a draft fan, what was going to happen. But man, what a finish. And obviously, go Team USA. That was fantastic. Team USA, well, I think that Freyette can officially say that he's gotten his payback for taking second place at the U.S. National Championships. Absolutely amazing. Now, going into the final... Uh, UK's there before the climb things weren't all said and done and what was this place went before we even hit the bridge it was still they didn't even start going uphill it was like there was a couple of attacks going through the piers lap banner uh downtown watopia and then on the on the back end of those attacks is actually when Tugles went. It was like he saw the momentum opportunity and then took that right. opportunity to get some free seconds and then just went with it. And I don't think it actually came back to bite him other than the reality of Freyat was just willing at the bottom of the KOM. You know, and then, and then also that was a good point. Uh, you know, just the dynamics of uh, honestly, like watching Zach Near, watching Bajor, watching Josh Harris, Josh Harris, who finished fifth today, um, was fifth last week as well. So someone else to watch for next week. Um, but yeah, going into that, it was just like attack after attack. Who has the endurance to just be patient, hang on to the back, and then go over um, uh, with that counter. So I will be replaying that <laughs> several times uh, just to be studying it from um, Neil's uh, perspective. But wow, just fantastic job. I don't even know if he could pedal right now. Yeah, and that is one thing for the overalls, too, is every single place mattered all the way to the line. I think I did see Brian Duffy Jr. come in around that top five or so as well. <clears throat> Ali Jones was right there. I did see some bigger names still able to make it into that top 10, which is extremely important, not just the top three for the overall championships. Now, yeah, did this now for me and the way that I'm thinking about this race playing out, you know, in-house here, my wife is racing tomorrow with Gabriella. I know you're racing tomorrow. Like there's, there's probably a lot of eyes raising going, whoa, okay. Did that play out the way that we thought it would, or was that totally different from the plans that we had made? And how do we have to go back to the drawing board? Is that, I mean, was there kind of like, okay, I have to rethink some things before tomorrow because of the way that we just saw the men play out. Hi, that's such a great question. I don't know. And I would, I wish I could hear uh, Gabby's point of view on this one. You know, it ended up not being a team dynamic as much as I thought that it would be. Uh, but at the same time, what a race of attrition. In, and it was just one after the other after the other. I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't really, you know, I don't know. I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss, but I am so excited to race tomorrow. I think that it's going to be so much fun. I think the women's race is a little bit different as far as dynamics go, as far as strength goes on what's going to happen. Uh, we won't have as many uh, in that front group, say, for pack dynamics and speed. So could breakaways happen like we saw with Belfort happen in a women's race last week? I don't know, you know, so where they just absolutely stick. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, and that's a really good point as well about the difference between the men's and the women's racing. 
a lot of times the men's racing sticks together like we saw, but when there was so much on the line, still, it was a breakaway that ended up winning. It was a late, late breakaway that did end up winning, but because of the nature of this race and how much pressure is on it, even within the men's race, that tends to end up coming back together uh, because of the strength of the field and how many riders there are. That might open up where it's just like, look, the rider who just takes the most risk in a race of attrition, like you had said, you used that word um, just a moment ago, that that changes the nature of the race, even within a situation where you usually see people come to a line all together. So in the women's race, it might even open up even more so to give people opportunity to really try and take it to the rest of the riders out there tomorrow. Right. The men also just kept attacking in the chase group. A lot of times the women look at each other like, hey, wait, are you are you going to go? Because I don't really I want to save my save my legs, you know. So that moment of hesitation in the women's race could give I mean, that gives an, another woman, you know, that extra one to two seconds to get ahead. Um, and without the pack, you know, with the pack dynamics of Zwift now and the latest update, you know, they may not get caught, especially at what the 1K, 2K breakaway. 100%. Well, uh, it looks like it's going to be uh, absolutely amazing racing out here today. Tomorrow for the women's racing, it's going to be, again, same course. Uh, the riders, I think, are going to be watching this back as much as, I mean, over and over and over again, getting as clear of a picture as they possibly can. Massive amounts of cash just awarded here out here today. Those two preems absolutely making a difference as we saw all the attacks over especially over that second time over the top of the KO. and we did see a lot of people trying to make breaks happen uh but uh in the end it was a final breakaway from a reduced field that ended up winning it out there today well let's head back over to the studio i think we may be getting some results coming in here in a moment but uh let's get some more thoughts from jez and danny Thanks, Nathan. That's a really interesting perspective, Danny. Thinking about wherever you're watching around the world, as Matt said, thank you for joining us because we are aware that people are watching us all around planet Earth, which is one of the most exciting things about it, for free on our YouTube channel as well, might I point out. Um, but amongst all those people watching will be probably all, I suspect all, of the elite women who are racing tomorrow night. What do you think they might have learned watching that, Danny, from your perspective? They'll definitely be making notes for sure. I think there's a lot they can take from watching the men's race. Obviously, they do race a little bit differently from Elisa's point of view. They seem to race a lot more cagey than the men's, which I think will play into some of the riders' hands. But if we look at the way that that race was ridden tonight, I think the women can learn that if they're not that kind of puncher type rider, that climb at the end is relatively short when we saw 13 watts per kilo being put out at the end there by our winner so if you're more of that pure climber you have to go earlier because I do think it will come down to a smaller group in the women's but ultimately someone who's still got a lot of that power left in the legs will come out on top. Danny Rowe. <laughs> you um, heard it here first. <laughs> Olympic champion, world champion, I'm looking to see if you react to this now, European champion right. I'll tell you what, I'm going to put another question to you about this and this is important. Our women who are racing tomorrow same distance, same course, same prize money, same rules, same everything. Makes sense, right? But our sport hasn't always been like that. And you've raised, you're a retired uh, rider now, but you've raced through a period where it was definitely not like that. Distance, prize money or anything. No, and I think Zwift are leading the way, actually. And we said that a couple of years ago when I was in Yorkshire doing a lot with Zwift. And I think it's amazing that they've almost been the trailblazers. And our sport is getting better and the women are becoming more equal as they should be. But it's just amazing to be here, to be, you know, alongside this great team where everything is equal and this is how it should be. And I'm really excited to see those women race tomorrow on exactly the same course with the same amazing prize pot, pot on offer. Of course, lots of the other people watching as well will be fans, friends, family, relatives, teammates of those who've been racing. So let's catch up with a few more of the results. I think we can see from about 51st place down. Yes, it is. That was a good guess, wasn't it? Uh, Leonard Gottwald. Let's look down through some of these names. Matt White is another one of those British riders in there. Dan Pettinger, uh, one of the elite Zwifters from Austria as well. Let's look at the next page. Hugo Bjort in there as well, finishing a fair way down the Frenchman, another one of our elite Zwifters in there. And Ed Laverack, who went for that opening, in fact, wasn't he our... He's uh... the ride-on winner. Yes, he was. The most ride-ons tonight. Well so, spotted. So uh, one of the popular riders in the race. 
yeah, congratulations, Ed. Good to see, good to see a real hardcore Zwifter. And a, I, I think it might have something to do with his following on YouTube, because he's quite a big YouTuber, Ed, as well. So from our perspective, nice to see a British rider getting the ride on jersey as well. Well done, Ed. Um, I believe we can now cross to an interview with our fresh winner. I don't know whether he's caught his breath yet. Neil Fryett, our American rider. Uh, hopefully we can cross straight over to him now. Neil, congratulations on your Zwift Games win. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, have you caught your breath yet? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, halfway recovered. Uh, Neil, can you talk us, we've got a slightly dodgy line. Can you talk us through how you feel like your race went today? Obviously it ended perfectly, but we didn't, we, you weren't mentioned that much in the commentary. You seem to be doing a very good job of hiding well and saving yourself. Uh, yeah, I kind of, uh, it was to, you know, as soon as my family just talked about, uh, and that kind of climb, and then hit the first half hard, and then take a small breather, and then deploy that feather power up, uh, just before that final, um, push to accelerate my avatar up to speed a little bit there. So, uh, yeah, it worked out, worked out pretty well. You know, two goals went early, which I kind of was thinking he might do and uh did my best to get up on his wheel and then you know power home so neil lots of swifters watching will never have raced over that kind of distance before in excess of 80 kilometers today what did you get through in terms of hydration and, and energy did you have to take on any gels or anything like that for this race yeah i had three i had three bottles um just packed with a bunch of maple syrup and uh orange juice water and then i had a a couple sides of caffeine. So I was doing some caffeine gels um, at a couple points. Same here. <laughs> so we keep Maple going. syrup, that's a new one. All that sugar yep. really clearly worked out for you tonight. That's the first time I've ever heard anyone taking on maple syrup in their bottles. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's fairly inexpensive. And, uh, you know, I just buy it by the bottle from Costco. And I think it ends up being like maybe a dollar a dollar a bottle in terms of um expense so you put like three or four tablespoons in, in each bottle and it's, it's, it's real boost neil one of the one of the things i love most about about the whole swift games is is connecting with where individual riders are around the world because we're seeing your avatars all in watopia we're here at the studio in london can you tell us where you are in the world what the weather's like outside and what time of day it is please <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's about it's about little afternoon here, twelve thirty, in Seattle, Washington, and uh, I think it's around 55, 58 degrees. Uh, it's kind of overcast and you know, a little bit a little bit rainy out. So. Neil, in a moment, we're going to be able to bring viewers the overall, the Wahoo overall standings, and we'll see how you're doing. But just before we do, how are you feeling about the finale next weekend on the Alp du Zwift? Uh, you know, I don't think I've got a chance there. I'm more of a probably kind of a punchy anaerobic uh, rider. So, um, you know, if I could top 20 there, I'd be pretty happy. But, um, you know, I'm sure some guys will be pushing over six watts a kilo for that climb and beyond the scope of what I can do. But, uh, you know, today, today worked out well because the course was kind of suited to my training. Well, fantastic. Neil, thank you very much. And congratulations on your win from all of us here. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care. Right, Bye. we'll look to see how he gets on next week. Maybe he can overcome his, uh, maybe maybe with the confidence of that, if he thinks he's got everything, nothing to, nothing to gain, everything to lose next week, we might see him going on the attack, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing to lose. And success breeds success, doesn't it? So you never, never know. Hmm. Should we have a look at how the men's championship is shaping up after round two? This let's is the biggie. It. Let's see what the effect has been. Well, well, this is provisional, let's not forget, okay? Because these numbers have come to us and they're being crunched by our boffins well beyond my, my own <laughs> modest mental capacity. But so far they show that after two rounds, Josh Harris is, on, is in the lead as well. Now, Josh Harris was one of our riders we picked out as a big favorite to look forward to today as well. He leads after two of three rounds in the men's championship over Bart Vend and Eckhout and Tom Thrall. 
Um, and it's close, look how close it is Danny as well, 192 points for Josh Harris. Even if you go down to Tepelario in eighth place, you're still only talking about 177 points. <laughs> as we knew it would, it's all gonna come down to the Alpe d'Huez, isn't it? It really is all to play for. You have to have that consistency, don't you, over every single race weekend. Yeah, this is the second page now, 11th down to 20th. The world champion Bjorn Andriessen there in 13th. Your boy Ollie Jones in 14th, and I can't see my pick anywhere in there. <laughs> what a shame, surprise, Jess. <laughs> surprise. Nicky Hurg in 20th place, and I tell you what, that's richly deserved after the way he was. He was our most attacking rider in the last 10K, wasn't he? The yeah, Swiss he was super, super impressive. Really put himself on the line, didn't he, in those uh, final few kilometres. Yeah. But lots of lots of late attacks, individuals attacking late on as well. and. Uh, yeah, we talked, didn't we, in the run-up to the race about how hard that is to stay away by yourself. We saw in the midsection of the race, as we were going into the jungle climb, a leading group of sort of seven, eight riders surviving, and they're all benefiting from that drafting. But staying solo, as we saw in there, to stay clear by yourself, you've got to be knocking on eight watts per kilo for any period of time just to get a gap. Yeah, you do. It's almost impossible. We have seen it happen before, but like you said, there's so much more benefit from being in that peloton. So, looking ahead to the next races in the Zwift Games, because we are far from finished just yet. Let's have a look, shall we? It's, of course, the women's epic tomorrow. Both of us are going to be here in the studio with you for, abs for that. And then next week, of course, as I said, the climb on the Alpe du Zwift. Men on the Saturday, women on the Sunday. Uh, it's going to be an epic, well, it is going to be yet another <laughs> epic is. weekend, isn't it? We've got to stop using that word, but we're going to be using it for tomorrow, definitely. Anyway, um, don't forget, it's not just about these elite races that we're showing you here on our YouTube channel because you can take part. The Zwift Games Community Series is going on right now and all the way through the month of March. I make you the sincere promise that I'm going to do at least one of them this week as well. I'm going to jump back on Zwift myself. Danny, you are as well, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I am, definitely. You heard it right here. <laughs> We've had 90,000 races so far, which is incredible. And if you've been inspired by what you've seen, you can go and take on the very same races that you've seen our athletes tackle today and with some huge community race fields, and they are big, trust me. They are. Right now, until the end of this weekend, you can ride the epic stage yourself. Then next week, it's the next sprint stage, Glasgow Crit Circuit, the final course from last week's sprint championship. Hopefully you've picked up some tips and tricks, so go jump on and give it a try. It's some of the best fun that you can have on a bike. Yeah, see how quickly you can get up that Clyde kicker as well, because that's always the decisive point. Um, anyway, if you miss any of the stages, do not worry as well, because of course you're going to have the chance to catch up again in the last two weeks of March. Wow, what an amazing evening of racing. It really was relentless, wasn't it, from start to finish. Please do join us tomorrow for what is going to be some even more fantastic racing from the women on the same course. And it's from me and Jez, we are going to wrap up and say goodnight, thank you, and most importantly, ride on. See ya.